I'm going to call this meeting to order. It's 9 a.m. If you'll please rise. I have a, there is a, a Pastor Bell here today to do the invocation. Oh, okay. And then Supervisor Gould, if you'll lead us in the pledge. Let us pray. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who provides protection and provision and peace for the, his people. And we pray this morning, Lord, that you do provide the protection for those working for this county, for the board. We ask for the provision that the county can use the funds to further this county. Bless them, Lord, with the peace, knowing that you are in control of all things. We ask for wisdom this day for this county board that they can provide for the people here. Be with us and bless us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Motion and action to call for an executive session to be held March 18th, 2024 at 9 a.m. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, I have had a request to move before we get started with anything is to move item 67 up. That was our executive session. And this is to uh, approve the recommendation of the selection committee for the appointment of the interim clerk of the board effective March 4th, 2024, with special detail pay at range 29, step one, at $44.72 per hour or $93,1760 annually. Pleasure of the board? Did I do something wrong? Oh, okay. I, I need a motion or something. Item 67. Chairman Angus, I make a motion that we approve the recommendation of the selection committee for the appointment of interim clerk of the board, effective March 4th, 2024, with special detail pay at range 29, step one, at 44.72 per hour or 93000 $17.60 annually, if it ends up being annually anyway. <laughs> okay. I need a second. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Welcome Laura Scubel to the clerk of the, of the board's chair. This is an interim appointment until we get all the applications in and go through them. And then uh, in, in sometime in the near future, we will put in the permanent uh, clerk of the board. Welcome, Lauren. I want to thank everybody who put their names in. And uh, we look forward to interviewing everybody when the time comes. <clears throat> Next up, we have another uh, out of order. Laura. OK, everyone good? <clears throat> And that is a presentation. This is a presentation of the Sheriff's Reach Out Facility on Adult Detention Center Campus by Public Works. And I believe there's somebody on the phone for this. Is that the case? Madam, <clears throat> Madam Chair, good morning. No, we have somebody in the room here. Oh, that to Oh, got it. OK. <clears throat> Before we get started, um, <clears throat> Mr. Latosky, on the detention center, can I just have Don Bischoff come up and just give a very short overview of what this program is? Certainly. Madam Chair and Board, good morning. So the uh, reentry program is, has been in existence officially and formally for about two years now. And at the simplest explanation, uh, our coordinators in the jail, uh, they work in the jail, and they uh, have the goal of trying to identify and assess every inmate that's booked into the jail uh, to obtain information about substance use, mental health, 
homelessness and a host of other issues with the idea that if that person is willing, we can try and get them either connected for the first time or reconnected uh, with services in the community upon their release. The idea being that if they can address the issues that seem to uh, result in them reengaging the criminal justice system, we can, we can slow that process down and, and hopefully eliminate it. So at the most basic level, that's what the program does. Thank you very much. I just want to tell everybody that this is a program that was started in Yavapai County, and it's been very, very successful uh, in recidivism rates. I believe the number is 30% decrease in recidivism, and everyone should know that this is entirely grant-funded. Yes. I'll turn it back over to Steve. Okay, unless thank you. Have other questions. All right, Steve, you're up. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. I um, appreciate this opportunity to uh, offer a presentation on the uh, new reach out facility. It is the anchor of the county's uh, cutting edge reentry program. The facility is located adjacent to the adult detention center and an intensive collaboration between the Sheriff's Office, our accomplished architect, LGA Architecture Las Vegas, and Public Works have facilitated a cost-efficient, inviting building in form and function. So final design and permitting uh, should close in June, with bidding and construction expected in 12 months. I am pleased to introduce the, the LGA's project manager, Calvin Haywood, uh, who will take you through the building design. Calvin? Uh, good morning. Um, again, my name is Kelvin Haywood. Uh, I'll be the project manager for uh, for this project throughout. Um, so I've been uh, involved since its inception, and I'll be here through completion. And uh, so I just want to walk you through the project. So I am driving this bus. So I think everyone is familiar with the site. Uh, this is the jail. If you and follow my uh, the little um, X over there, but the, the building in the center, you'll notice that, and we'll talk about this a little bit um, later, that uh, it, trying to ensure that we stay um, uh, in, within budget, we've actually reduced the size of the facility uh, from its original design from 7,916 square feet to 6,942 square feet. That's a saving of, of about a little bit less than 1,000 square feet. So. We know cost per square foot, thousand square feet. It's going to save pretty good, pretty good penny. <clears throat> the other thing that that we did in reducing the square footage is we were able to in shrinking the square footage. We were actually able to move the building about about uh, eleven feet to the west, which is a little bit further away from the building. That'll it will actually allow us a little bit more um, uh, landscaping that we were taking away from from that particular site. On this next slide, I'll walk you through the floor plan. Um, so the floor plan is very similar to what was or originally submitted. The reduction in square footage um, allowed us to remove one of the elevators. We actually had two. We actually took out a, the therapy office and a smaller, and we made the open office a little bit smaller. We did keep the coffee bar. But it, this plan still allowed us to maintain the integrity of the reach out goal um, that service and provides comfort for those that are coming out, again, to help reduce that recidivism. Uh, we want to create an environment where they can uh, come into this space, they can recharge their phones, they can think about some of the things that they've done in an environment that uh, that allows them to do so. We kept the um, the counseling, the legal office, uh, the consulting office, um, and there's other small offices. There's a conference room that can be used by the county and other, other meeting um, spaces. So, so we did keep that. Moving to the second floor where, um, where the detox area is. So we actually had a second break room up there. We reduced the break room. Uh, we did move the food prep because we do understand that the food can actually come from the from the county jail, um, and we reduced some of the store space. But this also allowed us to maintain the integrity of the detox flow. We kept the, the 12 beds, so that did not decrease. So that is still there. 
this second floor um, where the open area is in the yellow, um, you'll see some pictures um, soon at the end where uh, we're trying to, again, create a space where um, these people who are voluntarily uh, coming in to go through a detox um, part of their life, right, to, to again, get, get themselves together. Um, you'll see on the, some of the elevations, we talk about some of the northern lights that come in and we really want to create an, an, envir uh, an inviting environment. So as you come up to, to the jail, this is the first thing that you'll see or the, or the people will see um, before, um, before entering the space. And this is the, a view from the southwest. Um, as you look on the southwest side, you'll, um, side, you'll uh, see a two-story facility with natural earth tones, colors, with the design that speaks of movement. Uh, we wanted to invoke a style of transition, transitioning in and transitioning out. So uh, you'll see uh, some of the colors. If you walk up to this building, uh, we're mimicking some of those colors, but the style is just a little different. Um, again, it's, it, it's moving. It is a transition. It's a transition for the people who are coming out. It's also a transition for those that are going upstairs to the detox because they want to transition to a, to a better, better place in their life. This next view is from the, the northeast side as you come around, sort of looking from the parking lot um, across, the, across, the, the, across the lot. You'll see that we move the American flag and the state flag right up front. Um, so we are certainly proud of, of both of those. Um, and at the where the young man is standing uh, and the signage where it says Mojave County reenter building, that is the entry. We want to create a soft landing for the detox client clients that will uh, that will go in and be healed. So they are also looking at warm colors and um, and wood uh, type of material as well as some of the tan colors. What you don't see in that in that uh, landing area, we'll actually have uh, some seating. We'll also have some additional landscaping. So we're really trying to trying to include uh, as much landscaping um, as possible. This view, we're looking full on north, and at the top, you see those um, those clear story um, windows. Those clear story windows are um, where the detox center is um, on the second floor. So there's a lot of natural light that floods that area. Uh, we know with uh, facilities like this and schools, what have you, it's been proven that natural light enhances a person's life. Um, and so we wanted to keep that idea and we wanted to keep that in the design. This view is a view uh, directly east as a person comes out of the of the reentry. I was talking to uh, Butch this morning and he, he relayed a story of someone, actually a couple people coming out. And um, they're basically just directed to go down the hill. Um, there's, you know, the cell phone service. A young lady, she was trying to uh, get cell phone service. So she's just kind of standing and she probably wants to somebody to pick her up. You know, it's just as simple as that or make a call. Um, but this, um, this facility will allow uh, people to sit down and, and have cell phone service and charge up their phone. If they've been, you know, locked up for a night or, I don't know, 10 nights, whatever it is, so the phone their phone is dead. Um, so this view, once they walk out, um, you'll see to the left that wood sort of um, look. Um, it's an ephus finish. So again, we are, are, are trying to be very conscious of cost. Well, it's not um, the real wood, but it's, uh, it's, it's mimicking, but it still will, will create that feel. So as they come out, and then you'll see, actually, we are introducing pavers. When you think pavers and you think wood, you think of home. So as these people come out, it's it. The idea is very subliminally that, oh, boy, you know, they're going home, right? They're getting out of here and I don't want to go back. <laughs> so that's the idea. Um, and so this view is just from the Sally Port um, looking south again. Just another another view. As you look, um, we do have uh, we're doing everything we can to, again, mim minimize costs. So the mechanical yards are actually on the ground. And that's what you see there. And just a small mechanical yard um, landscaping. We redirected the the drainage channel to go underneath there. So to re, uh, to to reduce the, any type of flooding 
in that area. So now we'll move into, and hopefully I'm not going over my time, but now we'll move into the interior. Uh, again, as the um, clients um, come into the building from that east side, this is what they see. Um, you'll see um, there's a sitting area to the left, and they're, they're actually a, a, a desk where someone could receive them. Um, check them in, direct them to coffee or to a seat or to uh, if they wanted to speak to someone um, that they have the opportunity to to talk to them right there. We have um, some warm colors, uh, warm materials, um, warm lighting, everything, again, that evokes a, a feeling of, of comfort um, where, you know, because, you know, they're leaving this sort of cold space. As they go a little bit further in, you'll see more seating in this area. There's restrooms. If you remember from the floor plan, I can go back if, if you need. You'll see restrooms to the left. Um, you see some counseling areas um, uh, dead ahead and some other sitting spaces. Um, that hallway to the right is actually a hallway to where the um, conference room, the um, uh, the other offices, private offices where people can can go and, and sit and talk and receive the, any counseling that they might need. This last slide is actually uh, where we move upstairs uh, to the detox center, where you see uh, we are looking, um, we're actually looking east, but we're standing east uh, or west of the nurse's station. We're providing a couple seats where people uh, or someone, staff, nurses, um, can view the whole uh, second level. They can see all of the rooms. They can see the restrooms. Um, there's a small office right behind them. Um, and there's also a, a private uh, restroom for them. So they don't necessarily have to share with, uh, with the detox. Um, and if you, again, I could go back, but we also have showers um, in that second, uh, the second floor restroom. So uh, if someone stay, if they're staying overnight, or if they're staying seven days, uh, they are able to um, to um, have a sense of um, sense of pride in getting themselves back together. They can wash, they can be clean. Um, there's areas to sit and think. Um, we're very big uh, at LGA on um, the social aspect of person. Um, uh, when a person is is trying to or wants to um, like get themselves back in a state state of mind, that's a, that's in a good place. This is what we're trying to do. We want trying to create a, a good space, a good place for people to uh, to get back on track. And so with that, I'll end my presentation and answer any questions that you might have. Are there any questions from the board? Supervisor Johnson? Oh, sorry. Supervisor Bishop. Okay. So, uh, we'll go with Supervisor Johnson first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you said you cut almost a thousand square foot out. What was the original cost, and what's the cost now? I, he asked, "What you, we took a thousand square foot out, and what was the cost then, and what's this cost now?" So we are waiting. We just sent this revised plan out to our cost estimators. We're waiting for that that cost to come back right now. So I can't give you a specific price right now, but I will be able to send it out as soon as we, we receive that uh, within the next couple of weeks. The original, uh, Supervisor Johnson, do you want to follow up? Uh, I have some more, but go ahead if you want to clarify, Madam Chair. Well, I, just to finish up this estimate thing, um, so it was originally $5 million. That was several years ago, and it didn't get started. Not happy about that, but we're where we are. And now I believe that the Sheriff's Office received another $1.75 million from the Attorney General's office for specifically this building. So I'm assuming it is not going to be going over that because it can't. So if I remember correctly, and you can correct me, Don, that we were at uh, the original cost was around $3.5 million, and our first cost of that came in a little bit over $4 million, right? So then that's when we took that and we made some adjustments. So again, we're doing everything we can to actually stay under the $5 million okay, budget. Good. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to hear. All right, Supervisor Johnson, I'm sorry to have interrupted you. Thank you, Madam Is this nurse's station, is that 24 hours going to be, be staffed for 24 hours? 
So Supervisor John says, Captain Bischoff, the, the short answer is yes, the second floor of this facility uh, for detox purposes will be a medical detox facility. And uh, depending on how uh, a patient is doing, uh, they're likely to be probably there for about a week, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, but it will be around the clock. So there will be nursing staff there. The idea, the concept of the second level with the detox facility is to, to create a partnership in the community. So a community provider would actually be uh, running the detox facility services. It, it wouldn't be me sitting in the, in the nurse's station, unless the sheriff said so. Okay, when you talk about a detox center and then we talk about people leaving the jail, I assume that you're not allowing the people in the jail to stay high on drugs, so they need a detox as soon as they walk out. Is this more for people off the street to come and detox? Yes. The, the reentry, the first floor is for reentry, and for those coming into custody, generally they have a very short stay. Obviously, there's some that stay longer than others, but uh, to make a meaningful connection, uh, it requires more time, and for those that are out by the time they have their first port appearance, the reentry facility on the first floor gives uh, some of the community providers as well as some of the reentry staff the opportunity to connect with them even further and actually start making some uh, appointments and taking care of insurance needs uh, and and perhaps even doing assessments. The uh, the second level, the detox portion, would be. Uh, uh, open for community use. So we wouldn't be taking uh, those that were incarcerated and needed to detox and placing them in there. If they felt that they needed to be assessed and go through a detox, um, they certainly could. But it's that portion of the, of the project is, is community-based. Now, I noticed that there's no bars on the windows or locks on the doors, so this is strictly voluntary? This is voluntary. It will, it will be secured, but it's not a secured locked inpatient facility. So those that are there on the second level are there voluntarily. So it would be just like going to the hospital. You could leave any time you wanted to, even though your provider might recommend otherwise. So they can go in and out at, the, at their own will? No, they would, they would be there until uh, their provider uh, designated that they were uh, ready to be discharged, so they wouldn't be coming and going. Um, if, if they opted to leave before their treatment was completed, then they would be done. They wouldn't be allowed back in and, and, unless they were willing to start completely all over. Okay, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, before I get to Supervisor Bishop, I just want to clarify something that Supervisor Johnson said. Originally, I thought when we first started talking about this that the idea of the detox center was so people would not be detoxing in jail because that is not the right place to be detoxing. So that would be their first stop. On this, you know, obviously they're not using in jail, so it wouldn't be the second stop. So is, is that going to be part of the model? Well, depending on the, the, the partnerships that we can get with the, the community law enforcement, depending on the circumstances, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> they may be able to deflect or divert somebody away from an in-custody situation if they were willing. Again, this is voluntary. So if they were willing to, uh, and fit the criteria, to enter into the detox in lieu of uh, being incarcerated, that, of course, would be an option based on bed space availability and everything else. Depending on um, their, their length of stay and the uh, programs that are available through uh, the existing inmate health care uh, system inside the jail, they may or may not be able to uh, medically detox. Either way, they're going to detox mm -hmm. uh, in, in custody, depending on what their status is and their length of stay. Uh, they would do that inside the facility, but it looks much different than it, it would in uh, this facility. Okay. Supervisor Bishop?
I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for not having my mic turned on. So, Captain Bischoff, uh, thank you so much for this presentation, and uh, Steve Lukowski, and, and for our uh, designer architect. I like the idea that uh, we have a lot of natural lighting in this building and uh, the bright colors. I, I think that's very appropriate. Um, the landscaping with pavers is a nice touch, even though it's going to be um, not a lot. But I'm wondering, I, I saw gutters coming down from the second story. Will the stormwater be used for irrigation in any way uh, for, the, for the landscaping, such as it is? No, ma'am. We're not. We're not introducing a um, a a irrigation reuse system uh, in this project. Um, if we had the funds to do it, we could possibly do it. But that's a that's a that's a, a different type of design. So that's something that could be added later, if if so desired. It'd be tough to add it later, but it certainly could. Yes, ma'am. Hey, if, are if, we doing anything with the gray water reuse for irrigation purposes? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. We're we're getting that all out. Okay. Um, second question is uh, uh, probably for Captain Bischoff. Is this facility going to have any type of a, um, uh, say, a, a thrift store or something where inmates, you know, they come in in the winter time and get released in the in the summertime or vice versa, and, and um, they don't have the proper clothing to be released out on the street. Are you looking into doing something like this? So, good. so that's an excellent question, and that is part of the model, not necessarily to, to have goods and services available for sale, but it's, it's very common for people to come into custody during one season in Arizona and be released in a different season so their clothing is inappropriate. Sometimes, depending on the activities that they're participating at the time, they're not dressed appropriately uh, to be out in public for very long. So uh, uh, our model, as well as many of the reentry models, is to have uh, a pantry and, and closet of donated goods that, that can be issued out when it's appropriate. Uh, uh, one thing that we always deal with is a lack of adequate footwear and socks. So uh, we would have some of those things uh, collected up that could be donated out. Good, you know, because with being familiar with the jail facility, um, you you put an inmate's personal belongings into uh, storage, and sometimes they don't smell so good when they come out. And they usually never smell very good when they come back out. Yeah, but we uh, also have uh, laundry. Uh, when when we do encounter those, the jail of course has laundry facilities, and sometimes we'll try and get those cleaned up. But this facility would also, on the second level, would have some laundry facilities where we could help with some of that as well. Okay. Well, I know this program has been a long time coming. I think we first learned of this uh, at an ACO conference and then came back from that conference and uh, uh, toured the Yavapai facility. Supervisor Angus was uh, was with us and uh, Captain Bischoff, and, uh, and we met Sheriff Rhodes, and we learned of uh, the successes they've had, and uh, we hopefully learned from their mistakes and I'm sure we'll make our own along the way, but I am so glad to see this finally coming together uh, during my last term in office. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I just add what's exciting is getting to see programs and facilities like this uh, starting to take place all over our state. Pinal County will be building a facility uh, at the at the exit door of their facility. Of, uh, of course, Yavapai has theirs. Coconino has a version. Um, so it's it's exciting to get to see this kind of spread throughout the state. So we're kind of the third one on on uh, Yavapai and Coconino, and then we're, Mojave. We're second. Second. We're second. That's even better. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, yes, I just have one question. Um, from a from a data standpoint, uh, will we be tracking um, the effect that this has on recidivism? Obviously, it's that's. While this facility is grant funded, it's of importance to Mojave County citizens. Um, the less days that individuals spend in jail, the less um, per diem jail rates we have to pay as citizens. So um, are we going to be tracking yes. that to see if it's a, efficient? Supervisor Linger filter, correct. What, one thing that we've done is we've had to create uh, an interim uh, data collection program. And we've recently worked extensively with 
uh, Nathan and his team with the county IT department and kind of solidified uh, the data collection system that we have. And uh, we just recently acquired uh, some opiate settlement money for uh, Yavapai uh, Rand Lead, but just received uh, a substantial amount of funding for all the counties to start building a statewide data collection funding. So to your to your point, yes, we're we're gathering data, and once we get the the statewide system, uh, it will uh, it will make things it will make the data not only more consistent across the state, but it will make it more accessible to a lot of the stakeholders and community providers at varying levels so that they can provide better services. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Gould? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, sir, who's going to be making the decisions on the operation of this facility? Well, it is a county facility. The, uh, the first floor is just, um, for lack of better terms, is, is currently just going to be an expansion of uh, the Sheriff's Office jail operation. So it will be managed uh, by the reentry program management. The second level, the detox portion, uh, we will have to work with, obviously, procurement and everyone else to figure out how a partnership works for somebody in the community to come in and manage um, the second floor. So it's going to be under the sheriff's department then. We'll decide whether we put a priority on detoxing people that have been locked up or whether we're going to go out and look for people that need to be detoxed in the community. Well, it's kind of a loaded question. It the the building itself is going to be a county building. I guess it will it will be a shared responsibility between the sheriff's office and the county, like uh, like the existing uh, like the jail, for example. Uh, but as far as the operation, there will be a scope of work on how the detox uh, level of this building will operate, and just like anything else, the contracts and agreements that dictate how it's run and everything else. I don't know that the sheriff's office is going to go about looking for people to put into detox, but that is an that option. That's kind of what you said when you're opening it up to the community versus people that are coming out of jail that might think, geez, I screwed up, now I'm in jail, maybe I want to detox instead of going back to the flop house I live in. Yeah, as far as avoiding an in-custody situation, that's always an option. There's other options available to law enforcement, not just the sheriff's office, to deflect somebody out of an in-custody situation if they're willing to participate in something else. If they're experiencing a mental health situation and the crime is such that it's low level enough that those other options could be considered, then they can they can use some of the mental health facilities uh, throughout the county that are that are able to take in somebody, do assessments, do observations, and and deflect them as as a result away from an in custody situation. But it seems to me that we should be focusing on the people that are already that have spent some time in jail. Um, a night or two nights or three nights, they're not detoxed, fully detoxed. Um, it seems like I originally thought that was the idea, was that we were going to try to get those folks to check into the detox center before they walked right past it and out into the parking lot back into the world. So I'm concerned. So it's the sheriff's department that's going to make these decisions and not the board of supervisors. I'm not sure exactly which decision it's, it is that you're referring to. If somebody is in custody that needs to detox and they're only in custody for a day or two, they have the opportunity, once that uh, facility is operational, to check in. The difference is jail is not voluntary, and this detox center is. So uh, forcing somebody into detox is not something that the sheriff's office is going to be able to do. That has to be a voluntary thing, and that's why it's community-based. Earlier in your testimony, you referenced going to outside groups to bring people into the detox center that we're proposing to build. Is that correct? Community providers. Okay. To run the facility, not to bring people into the facility? Yeah. The sheriff's office is not going to go look for patients to put in there. Our idea is to partnership with a community provider to provide those services that would be open and available to the community. 
So we're going, not going to focus on the people that are getting out of jail. I realize I'm not talking about force. Well, I thought the could, whole thing was about an opportunity. It is an opportunity. Okay. So anybody getting and It released, sounded like we were going to turn to outside providers to bring in people that are out in the world to come into our detox center. Turning to outside providers to provide those services in this space. Anybody being released from the custody of the jail has an opportunity to plug into these services if they so desire. But if you're going to fill it up with people from the that are out in the world, there's how many? There's only what seven beds there? Twelve beds. Twelve beds. So that's going to end up being full. So the people that are coming out of jail are not going to have the opportunity to plug into that. They're going to go back to the flop house that they're living in, where they're going to go back to their drug using buddies, and the cycle just continues again. Well, I guess it's about making good choices, but. <laughs> they if they no, get actually, released, this is about government tax dollars. That's what this is about. Okay. And whether this is a useful purpose, a use of government tax dollars, or just uh, funding of deep of nonprofits, so we privatize welfare. Thank you, ma'am. Supervisor you, Gould, um, would you? Because there's a couple of things that I was hearing for the first time here as well. Maybe we can put this on a, a future agenda so we can get the sheriff in here as well and have all our questions answered about the facility. Because it's gone a little out of what I first understand stood it as well. So I want some clarity. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. That's what we'll do. And thank you. And to everybody who's watching and listening, this is a huge, big idea. Um, but it's, uh, it's good for the client. It's good for the community. And ultimately, it's good for the taxpayer. Because keeping people in jail is very, very expensive. Uh, and uh, if we can help people along the way, I think we all want to do that right now. It is all funded uh, by the state. How much, all, Don, how much altogether have we received for this particular program over the years? It was like five million for the initial, building. The initial appropriation from the state was five million dollars, and there's probably been an additional uh, close to four million. Uh, there have also been some grant funds that have been acquired through opiate settlement funds that have routed through um, primarily the Attorney General's office. I think office. it was more than that some because it was like $2.3 million. We were dividing it up amongst the yeah. three counties for like three years. So it's, it's probably about $12 million altogether that we have received to operate this and going forward there's enough buy-in from the state and the other counties that I believe it will be a line item um, and that's how we can afford to run it thank you any other questions thank you Jen, very much all right official business to come before the board discussion of pending or Contemplated litigation claims and demands. Mr. Esplin. Uh, good morning, Chairman. Uh, just have one matter. Just to note that in the case involving Mojave County versus the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, this involved the Greenstone water transfer. Uh, the the uh, U.S. District Court granted the county's motion for summary judgment. The party, the the plaintiff's motion for summary judgment. The next hearing in that matter is set for a status conference of April seventeenth, twenty twenty-four. Thank you. Thank you. Committee and or legislative reports, uh, Supervisor Bishop. Um, thank you, Chairman Angus, and uh, thank you for that report, uh, Mr. Esplin. So the last couple of weeks, I've been uh, pretty active with the County Supervisors Association, um, attending their LPC meetings, the Board of Directors meetings, and so forth. I've also been active with the Arizona Criminal Justice uh, Commission as a commissioner and um, have chaired the Board of Health meeting. Mr. Resilien Felter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we continue to monitor a few water bills at the state um, capitol. I won't get into too much of that. I think we have a lobbyist report this morning, or I assume we do. Um, other than that, I don't have anything else. Thank you. Supervisor Gould. Nothing today, Madam Chair. Supervisor Johnson. Nothing, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I, too, uh, attended the LPC 
via Zoom, and uh, we're hearing about all the bills, different bills that are making their way through the legislature. It's been interesting this year. There are voter integrity bills. There's a, a, a kind of a, a flurry of zoning, um, things like that, that we're watching carefully. Some of it sounds good. We we're, we're always look for the unintended consequences of these kinds of bills, and there's water bills going going forward, and Supervisor Lingenfelter and I uh, attended a meeting with the sponsor of the big water bill, and that was in where we're really monitoring that, making sure that what they do in Phoenix doesn't hurt us up here. All right. We'll go right now. I'm, I know we have a lobbyist report, but let's get the county manager's report out of the way, and then we'll go back to that. Madam Chair, board members, I have no report this morning, and I would like to get to the... Okay. Uh, Water do we report. have Nick Ponder on the line? Yes. Okay. We do, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> thank you again for the opportunity. As Attorney Esplin indicated, we were very pleased with the decision of the court uh, in in request uh, to the judgment on the Greenstone transfer. I can also say that the Attorney General was very pleased with that result as she had filed an amicus brief. Um, and reached out to both myself and Supervisor Lingenfelter with her enthusiasm about the outcome. Uh, we continue to follow. So there were six bills that we have weighed in on. Three of those seem to be effectively dead or not moving. Um, the other three bills that are outstanding have to do with measuring devices and the ability or inability of the state to require measuring devices in areas that were subsequent INAs. Um, while the bill doesn't directly impact Mojave County, one of the challenges with the bill is that it actually limits what the state can require on the state's own land because uh, there's a language in the bill that says notwithstanding any other law. Um, that bill made it out of the House and actually got its hearing in the Senate Natural Resource Committee and made it out last week of the committee. Um, there's an HCR, which is it's just a resolution. It doesn't go on the ballot, but it says that rural Arizona has all the tools that it needs to address its water challenges. Uh, that bill uh, made it out of the legislature on party line vote. Uh, what is interesting is the sponsor of that bill is also the co-sponsor of Senator Kerr's bill bringing additional tools to rural Arizona. So it's a, a bit ironic. Um, on the Basin Management Area Bill, that's Senate Bill 1221. This is the, the, the large bill that we've been talking about uh, that Senator Kerr is sponsoring attempting to, um, in her words, bring some type of conservation to rural groundwater. Um, I've provided you all notes on that bill. Um, there was an amendment offered on the floor of the Senate last week. Um, by and large, that amendment really has to do with accounting for tradable uh, or leasable water certificates and how the department and the the conveyor and conveyee would account for that new water. Um, so that bill, again, did make it out of the Senate on a party line vote. However, there were a number of Republican members who stood up and spoke to their concerns about the bill um, and that it did not address uh, their needs for rural Arizona. That includes um, Senator Borelli, who spoke up in the Committee of the Whole, um, as well as Senator Kavanaugh, Senator Bennett, and others who spoke up uh, when it was third read to get out. Um, and, and Senator Kerr did say that she was, was willing to meet with people and have those conversations. There's one additional item on that that I think that we, that might have been overlooked um, by uh, a lot of the, the folks who have been looking at the bill, including um, uh, myself, that I will say, it grants water rights um, in the bill without any requirement for conservation. And then in doing so, effectively, I think the concern is that a right to a certain amount of water 
in effect is a contract to that amount of water. And Article 2, Section 25 of the Arizona Constitution precludes the abrogation of a contract. So I think the concern that we've been going forward with all along, that there, there's not enough conservation in here, um, is actually even uplifted even more by this uh, Article 2, 20, Section 25 of the Constitution, which means that once rights are conveyed, there can no be there can be no further amendments to legislation that would then abrogate those rights or diminish those rights. Um, so that's why we need to really get the policy correct this first time around. Um, we continue to have conversations. Um, you know, I'm I will continue to meet with the Mojave County delegation. Uh, I will continue to meet with Senator Kerr at at uh, her availability to try and get us to um, a workable solution on this. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Ponder? Supervisor Bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chairman, excuse me. Um, Mr. Ponder, that HCR is a striker. It, Mr. Ch it's going to be used as a striker, I'm sorry? Uh, generally, if you run a bill that does nothing and you run it over into the other body, it's, it's striker ammunition, so it's sitting over there waiting for them to strike something on to run it back the other way. It's an HCR, so it's, it'd have to go to the voters, but put your striker radar on. Thank you, sir. Yeah, will do. Thank you, sir. Okay. Anyone else? Staff? Mr. President Felter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the only thing that I would add to what Mr. Ponder has offered this morning on uh, Senate Bill 1221, um, Supervisor Bishop and I represent the Kingman area, and that's really what our concern is with this bill um, within Mojave County. Uh, we talked to the city of Kingman. Their main concern and focus is to provide the most affordable water rates to over 65,000 people and businesses for as long as they possibly can. Um, this bill would quantify groundwater rights to Saudi farms, Central California farms that have been here within the last 9, 10 years, with the majority of water user, uh, users now in the Wallapai Basin, and if the city wanted to grow, that they would have to go hat in hand to these corporate farms and purchase water credits from them at the taxpayer's expense, and we are against that. So there's, a, there's many other things that we're opposed to in this bill, but we're going to continue to monitor it. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, anyone else? Supervisor Johnson? No. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Ponder. Thank you. Okay, I am uh, at this time before the call to the public, I am going to bring up uh, another uh, issue and it is a public hearing. There are people here that I know need to leave. Sure, so, yes. Do we have a county manager's report? We did it already. He said no. Okay. Thank you, though. Um, yeah, so it's number 53. It's a rezone public hearing. So I'm going to open the public hearing for item number 53. And that is uh, discussion possible action to approve or deny the adoption of BOS resolution number 2024-06, which is a rezone um, to allow for a campground in the Kingman vicinity. It was uh, talked about at PNZ, and the commission recommended denial by five to one with the chairwoman abstaining. So um, the applicant has asked to speak first, Mr. Chase Spillman. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Chase Spillman. I reside at 15218 East Fackley Springs Road, Kingman, Arizona. Uh, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the board, I would like to first begin by saying thank you, firstly, Madam Chair. Thank you for your diligent consideration and the hands-on approach you've taken uh, regarding this rezone. You've driven a long way a few times to discuss our concerns, and it really, truly means a lot to us. Supervisor Langenfelter, thank you so much uh, for taking the time as well to come out and visit our farm during your busy schedule. The time you both have taken has really shown the lengths you're willing to go for us citizens uh, that are part of Mojave County. It has been and will continue to be our intention to allow families and individuals a chance to experience firsthand the rich richness of our rural farm life and the many opportunities that await the next generation of American farmers through agritourism and other innovative uh, farm 
Nevertheless, I've come to the conclusion that the recommended commercial rezone is not the appropriate course of action for our farm. And so, Madam Chair and distinguished supervisors, we humbly request that you withdraw our application for a commercial rezone. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, there are other people, there are people uh, who signed up to speak, given that the applicant is wishing to withdraw. Is there anyone who would like to still speak? Okay, hearing none, I'm gonna close the public hearing. And what's the pleasure of the board? Oh, well, we, we just move on, right? We just uh, continue it, not continue it, just no action taken. Take no action. Take no action, okay. Thank you very much. That was item 53. Now we're going to go to the call to the public. A public body may make an open call to the public during a public meeting, subject to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions to allow individuals to address the public body on any issue the jurisdiction of the, in the jurisdiction of the public body. At the conclusion of the open call to the public, individual members of the public body may respond to criticism made by those who address the public body. Okay, we do have um, quite a few people, so I'm going to do what I've been doing, which is I'm going to call someone and then somebody on deck. Please come down. You can sit at that uh, seat there at the corner. Be ready to go so we can get, these th get through this in a timely way. First up, John Keck. Second up, Roger McClellan. Thank you very much. Hello, board. Hello, everyone in Mojave County. Today is a beautiful day. This is a beautiful county. And I just want to remind us all that God created us for a special purpose. There were no mistakes in his plan, and we are all created for this time in history. Yes, there's a lot of fear in the world right now. Between all the millions of illegal immigrants coming into our country and all the shots everyone's taken, and all the plastic, in our water bottles that we drink, that the EPA has already presented to us, we have to overcome this fear with faith and proclaiming God's word. Skip a meal today with us and read Psalms 35 and proclaim it. And when your stomach growls, let that remind you to open up God's word. If you would, write this down. Psalms 35, verse 18, verse 15 through 18. But in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me, and I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease. With ungodly mockers at feasts, they gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions, my precious life from the lions. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. Yes. These fears we have are a byproduct of unfair elections. This week, there was a Board of Health meeting, and the Health Department presented on vaccines, and he presented the VAERS program, which is the various adverse reactions to vaccines. And at the beginning, he discredits it right away as a valid source of information, because it is all done anonymously and electronically. He tries to use these facts from VAERS to show that there are only 100 people in Arizona who have died or had a reaction to the shots. We all know someone who has died or had a reaction. I mean, let's take a second. If you would, raise your hand if you know someone no, close Mr. to you. No, Mr. Sir, sir, you need to address us, sir, not the audience. We all know somebody. I can name three people very close to me off the top of my head. Two of my grandmas and one of my people close to me I consider a sister. And one of those grandmas is like the board up here. She was a member of the CARB, Air Resource Board, in that place next door to us. She now has the new turbo cancer after being proud to be a part of these test shots. The point is, this is all a byproduct of unfair elections. Just like with the vaccine reporting done electronically, that's like our election electronic voting machines. They manipulate it behind the scenes. And just like the anonymousness of submitting those VAR forms and how they can't be trusted, it's the same with mail-in voting. Just because you signed outside of an envelope, it's all done anonymously. Thank okay, you very thank much. you, Mr. Keck. So Roger McClellan and then Don Matson.
Madam Chair and Board, good morning. My name is Roger McClellan. I live at 2610 East Myra Street in Fort Mojave. I live in the Sunrise Hill development and am here today to express my sincere opposition to this natural gas-fired power plant to be built in close proximity to our housing development. The basis for my objection, I believe, is rather simple. The property was originally and rightfully zoned agricultural, residential. The petition to request rezoning was only approved for if specific requirements were met. The prior owner failed to meet any of these requirements. He was aware on the approval that if the specific requirements were not met, the land would be reverted back to its original zoning, agricultural, residential. He did not meet any of the requirements. However, the rezoning to revert it back never took place. This, I believe, was a mistake. This mistake had to help downstream approvals possible, approvals possible as the property was incorrectly zoned. The question I would love to ask the supervisors is, did you know? Did you know the exact location and area of the natural gas turbine peaker plant when you approved it? Did you know that? Did you know how the close proximity to our housing development, 1,320 feet, when you approved it? Did you know that? Did you know the current parcel zoning was supposed to be reverted back to its original agricultural residential zoning due to the fact that petitioning landowner failed to complete any of the stipulations required? Did you guys know that? Because if you knew these facts, I have trouble understanding how this process has progressed this far. This is a potentially much needed project which has been designated in the wrong area. While it may be economically advantageous for MEC to locate the peaker plant there, it is simply too close to the residential housing period and needs to be it needs to find a more suitable site. While I understand that MEC is getting annoyed with our group, we are heavily invested here and we are not backing down and we will continue to advocate and promote a suitable solution. What I would ask each of the supervisors who may not have had all the facts available at the time of your vote, I would ask you to do some soul searching. And if for any reason you are not clear on all of the facts in this future development, I would ask you to do the right thing and rescind your vote. Please do the right thing. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Don Matson and then Mac McKeever. Hello, my name is Don Matson. I live in uh, Fort Mojave, approximately 2,000 feet from the proposed location. What I want to point out today is some information we've learned from the town hall, and I've kind of been looking at the history of the Board of Supervisors meetings, and I noticed some interesting things here and there. And I'd like to point out something with my uh, chart here. This uh, chart shows where MEC is. They are part of the cooperative with AEPCO. AEPCO provides uh, electricity to all of these colored areas on this map. Uh, the facility I want to build near our homes is right here next to Bullhead City, and that's where they say they're primarily going to provide the power. But in our town hall meeting, uh, it was mentioned from Patrick Ledger that this is a cooperative. AEPCO is all about providing electricity to all of their members. MEC is proud to be part of that group, and these are all of the areas where they are provi providing power in this community. Notice quite a bit here in Nevada, which are these dark areas. Notice this little dark area over here in California. So even though MEC says today it's all going to be locally used electricity, when those other areas have shortages, they go to the community of all of the providers of electricity in the cooperative to get the electricity they need for all of the areas. So this power plant we're putting in this tiny little area here in Bowhead City 
is likely going to provide electricity for Nevada, California, southern Arizona. I did have one last comment to make, and that is I was reading through the many, uh, the Board of Supervisor meeting minutes of 12-4-23. Supervisor Lingenfelter says, I am absolutely against companies coming here and using our resources and then shipping all the power west. The response from Ron Martell, or John Martell was, so are we. This says that the power, although the west portion is Nevada, if you want to be critical, the west is Nevada and California, but this is power used outside our area. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Mac McKeever and then Jerry Grinstead. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Board of Supervisors. I'm Mac McKeever. I live in Fort Mojave in the Sunrise Hills Estates on Shelby Road. So today I just want to uh, reemphasize a couple of things that I actually mentioned last week uh, in here. Talked a little bit about the water last week, and I know how important the water usage is here in, you know, Mojave County. Something that came to light this week, the water that they're using in this peaker plant has to be RO water. So the 100 homes worth of water that they advertised as using, they have to go and create a RO system and run that water through an RO system to get RO water to inject into the SCR scrubbers. So they're actually going to use about twice as much water as what they've advertised. And that SCR scrubber and the RO water came directly from the manufacturer of this LM6000 turbine, uh, aeroderivative turbine. So that's on their website, and uh, the AG&T confirmed it has to be RO water this week. So, and then uh, the other thing I want to talk about a little bit, going through the uh, planning and zoning manual, the Section 37W Industrial Performance Standards, talks about noise ordinances. And... Uh, purpose of the standards, it says, is to ensure that industrial development benefits Mojave County without subjecting it to conditions that adversely affect public health and safety. So if you go down to 37W paragraph F, it talks about no noise or vibration other than normal vehicular traffic shall be permitted, which is discernible on neighboring residential sites to the unaided human senses for three minutes or more duration in any one hour of the day, between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. are 30 seconds or more duration in any one hour between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. So this display that I have here, this is where the site A is for their proposed peaker plant. And you can see the lines that come out here. I know this is really hard to see, but this turquoise line that's around this area that comes right through these houses, they say that that noise level will be basically the same as a dishwasher running in the next room. Well, that's definitely a discernible noise level that's going to be greater than three minutes an hour between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., and definitely greater than 30 seconds an hour between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. So the Site B location, which they're, you know, are now trying to push to, and I bring up Site B because I know that's one of their alternate sites to look for after Site A. These lines still transgress through the houses. They actually are more along the houses over on this side once they move the plant to the site B location. Again, it's basically the same as having a dishwasher run. We, uh, we are already in violation of the, the performance standards by zoning, uh, planning and zoning, and we haven't put a mitigation plan yet, and we've approved this so far. They need to go back and look at what their mitigation plans are. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Mr. Grinstead and then Wayne Hollins. Wayne Hollins, you're next up. Come on down. Good morning. My name is Jerry Grinstead. I live at 2613 East Nez Perce in Fort Mojave. I'd like to read to you this morning the mission statement of Mojave County. The mission of Mojave County is to serve the citizens through the efficient management of resources and the promotion of co cooperation among communities in a visionary manner that enhances the lives of those served. 
Mr. Gould, we'd like to thank you for the work and your continuing efforts of serving our district, District 5. We appreciate you. One has to wonder how four of you on this board thought having a natural gas fired power plant so close to our neighborhood would enhance the lives of our community in Fort Mojave? That's a valid question. In the past, many of us have received our ballots and voted with trust based on a belief that the local officials really wanted to enhance our community and county. We now know that's not true. I probably do not have to remind any of you that this is an election year, and as my wife says to those four supervisors, the board has awakened David against Goliath. She also says, Jerry, follow the money and we'll get to the truth. We are researching candidates this year with a bright light and a larger magnifying glass than we ever have. I suggest you start your day after your prayer with reading the Mojave County mission statement every day. A motion to reconsider this terrible and unjust power plant zoning action is way overdue. You're wasting your time, you're wasting our time. Do your job. Thank you very much. Mr. Hollins. Wayne Hollins, Golden Valley. Uh, supervisor, uh, chairman and uh, supervisors. I'll change the subject a little bit back to, to water. Uh, I appreciate uh, Supervisor Bishop's uh, questions this morning on the water harvesting uh, thing on that new project. Uh, sometimes I feel like you just listen to me and think I make up what I'm talking about here, but I actually have read books that are written by the experts, and the one in particular is your Mojave County Low Impact Development Guide. <clears throat> And I told you this before, and I've read it before, the county, if we get just five inches of rain in the county, 3.59 million acre feet of water. In the INA area, 1,820 square miles, five inches will get you almost 500,000 acre feet. We're short 34,000 acre feet. <clears throat> so 2% of that 3.59 million is all it takes to, for the domestic use of the all the municipal water use in the county. So the LID, Low Impact Development, multi-benefit decentralized drainage infrastructure is necessary to address community flooding, water supply, and quality of life improvements. Why is decentralized water infrastructure important? mitigate nuisance flooding, drainage issues associated with high frequency storm events, and reduce overall stormwater runoff volumes. Provide stormwater management alternatives at a scale for residents to implement and construct with limited resources, like your shovel and hoe. Promote water conservation through groundwater recharge. Improve stormwater quality. Reduce erosion and sedimentation. Improve soil health and increase soil moisture. Again, conservation is, is just as important as regulating the water that's coming out of the ground. If we're not doing enough to put it back into the ground, what did we accomplish? And spending $3 million to put 185 acre feet into the ground. Not that it's not needed. That's a lot of money for three million bucks. The people in the Mojave County that live here, and they're responsible for this also. They need to get out there and do their water harvesting. Thank you. I Thank you very it. much. Um, Jeff Esposito, you have um, 
something, some stuff from our consent agenda listed. Do you want to speak about it now, or do you want to wait until we pull it from the consent? Okay. And then uh, Pastor Roy Hagemeyer. First, I've got to uh, tell you people that uh, $5 million for a building, $7 million for a county animal shelter. I mean, really, are you building your houses with uh, gold or something? I mean, I can't believe this. This is our money. Yeah. Think twice. Oh, my God. All right. Well, I want to speak first to number 12. Uh, the, the the Red Cross is not what you really think it is. It's this organization is is uh, I don't know. It, it's it's just not right. Uh, you're you're going to vote on a two year renewal of space license agreement uh, for office and storage and and uh, all this kind of stuff. And and you're not going to charge them anything at all. Well. That that's kind of boggles my mind. Uh, this organization is providing maps to illegals on how to travel to the border and where to cross. I guess they have a red cross right there. Uh, and also, they're on the board of FEMA, which allocates millions to nonprofit groups supporting illegals released into the United States. Nonprofit. <laughs> How you be a nonprofit nowadays in America is you you raise people's salaries. Uh, the, the the CEO is receiving seven hundred and ten thousand dollar salary plus incentives and bonuses and all the other benefits. The the fifteen execs on the uh, their board uh, really receive seven point five million in compensation plus the benefits. They have 18,000 uh, employees making an average of $76,000 a year. Uh, their, their income was $3.1 billion, out of which $2.1 billion was made through the sale of donated blood. I'm not against donating blood. I'm doing it Tuesday. And I have non-vaccinated blood, so mine's primo. Uh, again, I've, I've told you over and over again that the WHO, the UN, the NIH, the CDC are using our health department to get a control over your constituents. And you keep sending them to these org organizational meetings across the country, grant funded. Again, grants cause subordination no matter what department it is. Thank you, Mr. Esposito. Yeah, I wish I had more. <laughs> Pastor Hagemeyer, and then Chris Rodardi. Good morning, Chairman Angus and Board of Supervisors. I'm here this morning to let all of you know that you failed in your duty to keep our elections safe and secure. We, the people, have a duty to hold you accountable, and you have allowed the evil of Phoenix to scare you into submission. We read in Exodus 18.21, Moreover, look to able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe. Place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. We, the people, according to God, are to select men and women who are trustworthy to govern, those who hate a bribe, those who are trustworthy, those who fear God. Noah Webster cited this biblical verse in his statement, let it be impressed on your mind that God commands you to choose for rulers men who will rule in the fear of God. Webster went on to say that if the citizens neglect this duty, unprincipled men attain office and the results will be public corruption, incompetence, and the waste of revenues. Our founding fathers believed that the preservation of this republic depended upon the obedience to the Bible by both the citizens and those who they choose as leaders. When the righteous increase, the people rejoice, but when a wicked person rules, people groan. 
For freedom to reign in this representative republic in which we live, it demands free and fair elections. Elections that we, the people, can see, that we can watch, that we can observe, and that we can verify. That right has been taken away from us here in Mojave County by this body, the Mojave County Board of Supervisors. Every portion of our electoral system has been changed to be electronic, making it more than ripe for fraud and manipulation. And I believe that every one of you know that and understand that fact. It is our responsibility to hold you accountable for your actions, both good and bad. And we are demanding our elections be returned to our county for our oversight. God entrusted this nation, the United States of America, to the people. It is the people's nation to keep it or to lose it, and we the people intend to keep it with or without you. For this reason, citizens must be well informed and vote for candidates that will govern by biblical principles. The citizens should know that the Bible says that civil government relying on the Holy Spirit to guide them. Psalm 25, 12 says, Who is the person who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way that he should choose. Elections of principled leaders promote the ability of citizens to lead quiet and tranquil lives in godliness and dignity. Samuel Adams said those who have a share in making it as well as judging and exercising the laws should be men of singular wisdom and integrity. The, the Lord loves fairness and freedom. Thus, Christians have a moral responsibility to stand against dishonesty and fraud in the election processes, whether by illegal votes, by manipulation of technology, by unconstitutional changes to the ro voting rules, or by foreign interference. This is necessary to ensure that God-fearing moral righteousness and just men and women become leaders. Christians should not be invested in their candidate that they don't tolerate or will tolerate fraud. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Rodarty and then Philip Robinson. Chris Rodarty, Mojave County taxpayer. In 1778, John Adams said, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Thomas Jefferson wrote, God grant that men of principle shall be our principal men. George Washington warned us to guard against the impostures of pretended patriotism. Another wise directive from Jefferson, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. And Noah Webster said it all when he said, if the citizens neglect their duty and place unprincipled men in office, the government will soon be corrupted. Laws will be made not for the public good so much as for selfish or local purposes. Corrupt or incompetent men will be appointed to execute the laws. The public revenues will be squandered on unworthy men, and the rights of the citizens will be violated or disregarded. Could any of our founders envision the State of the Union in 2024, the precious republic for which they sacrificed their blood and treasure? Mojave County, we are no shining beacon of freedom. We, too, have neglected our duty as citizens to vet and scrutinize political candidates. The corruption and fraud rampant in D.C. has oozed its way into rural Red America where it now flourishes. We have another election coming up, and nationally it will no doubt be another clown show, but locally as well, in my opinion. Lately, I have been reading accounts that call into question the integrity of local public servants running for election. Fact or fiction, time will tell. But the erosion of faith and trust has left me, and no doubt others, distraught and demoralized. What's that saying? Absolute power corrupts? Power corrupts absolutely? As human beings, we are fallen, sinful, and corrupt. Our only salvation is in our Lord Jesus Christ. As the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. May God have mercy on our souls. Okay, Philip Robinson and then Brett Forrester. Madam Chair, thank you, uh, Philip Robinson. I've got some great news for Mojave County. 
we started a group four months ago out in Golden Valley called Conservatives for Golden Valley. Me and John have started that group. We are very proud to announce Sheriff Lamb will be coming March 30th. I am inviting you. It's out at Great West or Great American Pizza out in the valley. Robert and Kat have, are helping me put this on. Um, what we did at, at the conservatives is I've got a trailer that's coming out. I've got sound coming out. We're doing the advertisement for it. We're, in the, yeah, we're going to be in the standard. We're also going to be on a radio station. And I'm also trying to get a hold of Cameron. You probably know who um, Mike Fletcher is. I'm going to be getting a hold of him and see if the Cameron will be, will do some pre-advertisement for us. Uh, we're just a small group right now. And then April 3rd, 6th, sorry, April 6th, we're having our first debate out in Golden Valley. Thank you, Hildy, for wanting to join that. It's for LD30 Congress? State Senate. State Senate. Thank you. Um, that's going to be our very, very first debate besides being on the fire department. When we used to be back in the day doing the debates, uh, Butch Merriweather has decided to be our moderator, which is very, he's a very biased individual. I look, he put on awesome debates for the fire department back in the day when we were having trouble. A lot of you were around during all that trouble. Um, and then I think that's all good news. But now to read the reason why I'm up here. Uh, me and Attorney Espen, back in the day before I went on vacation, uh, I wasn't real sure about how all this worked and the call of the public, and I finally figured it out. <laughs> but anyway, the reason why I'm bringing that up is back in the day, we were told that uh, out of district, I'm talking about GVID, out of district people were going to get charged more. Is that still on the books? Because I, I do a lot of my own rain harvesting, so I don't know. It, it, there's no place on my billing where it says I'm out of district. Uh, but anyway, what that's all about is... Thank, thank you. Thank you. And I assume, well, I, I'll talk about more. Uh, Next right. Time. I recommend that you go to your supervisor and have these questions answered. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Brett Forrester, and then Greg Beffert. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, Board of Supervisors. Uh, first, I'd like to do, because I have more information here than obviously will take up the three minutes, I'd like to go ahead and put out uh, three video contacts uh, that you can go on to .org. One is A, the letter A1000cuts.org. The second is an HTTPS double backslash uh, handcountroadshow.org backslash events backslash Mojave dash county dash AZ backslash. The third is state dash of dash denial.org. These are videos that explain the tools and the things that have happened to our election system. It has been completely destroyed. We have no chance whatsoever of having any integrity or security in what is our most precious thing, a vote. Just like you sitting up there on these chairs, you're voted into position. You're not put in there by any other means. So as Americans United and versus unfair elections, elections are the only civil way to settle political issues. Your right to vote is the most important right because it is determined and determines all of our other rights. What the enemy has been doing, and that enemy can be many, many different facets, using mail-in ballots, as long as this is around, we have no choice but it be stolen. 
Using drop boxes, drop boxes have no ability to be able to be secured as we've seen in the past and of which we've already also seen starting already with uh, Governor Hobbs and what's going on in Maricopa. Using online voter registration allows those to be able to make voter rolls seem as large as possible for ill-gotten Ill gains. Using military voting abroad, 1, 150,000 military votes in Alaska in 2020. Using voting machines to cause chaos in 50% of the ballots and had issues. Our goal is to stop election fraud. Go back to paper ballots, hand counted same day, counted where the ballot was cast with cameras done at the precinct level. Get back to the way voting used to work. We, the people of Arizona Alliance firm, stateofdenial.org, will show you all of this. What you can do now is do not mail in your ballots. Register to vote and actually vote. Who else do you know that would be able to be like to see this information? One, once again, we go to a1000cuts.org, seven-minute video, Maricopa. Get involved. Get others involved and continue to develop the America First Agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Greg Beffert and then Chuck DeShazer. Supervisors, for the record, Greg Beffert, Mojave County Taxpayer. Last time I was up here, I, I gave a, some of the tenets of, of Satanism, the Satanic mindset. And really what it is, is, is in a nutshell, is egotism. It's the worship of the self. It's not, the, you know, the, the, the red-horned uh, beast that, the, you know, Christian, Christianity makes it out to be, nor is it the jinn from Eastern traditions. It's the worship of the self, an e e egoic mind. And that's what prevents a lot of you from pivoting off of the positions that you've taken on some of these issues. When you make a mistake, whether it was COVID-19, and, and back in 2020, it tried to get you to, to look at another perspective and to pivot on the positions that you were taking because you were causing harm. You never looked at the harm that you were causing. Never looked at the, the, the cost-benefit analysis of the harm to the kids, to the community, to the businesses, to the economy, to the psyches of people. And I told you last time, those at the very top of that power pyramid have a knowledge differential. And they used that. They used it during COVID-19. These are master psychologists. These are ancient priests, if you want to call them that. This is a priest class who understands how the human psyche works, and they did a number on you during COVID. Kept you in a state of fear and confusion. You know, lied to you, misdirection, changed definitions of terms, whether it was pandemic or the definition of a vaccine or whether it's a definition of being fully vaccinated. They kept you in that R complex. You know, these are master psychologists. And, and many of you fell for it as well. You're not immune from it. And neither of the people that sit in this audience out here or watch on TV I was speaking to, the, to as much them as I were as I am to you people up here. You know, the, the unfortunate aspect is that most people in society possess a satanic mindset or adhere to one of those tenets and don't realize it, or don't admit it to themselves. But subconsciously, they do. I'll be back to talk more about that later. Uh, what I want to get on the record is my response to the public apology that Supervisor Angus gave. That was part of four things that I asked for when I filed my complaint with the county. One was a public apology. One was a retraction of the resolution that you didn't pivot on when you should have, the support for Israel. The other one was the inclusion of the proclamation I gave Supervisor Gould that's been sitting on your desk since October. Can we move this thing along? And the last thing was your resignation. You know, whether I get it or not is irrelevant. I didn't vote for you. Thank you. Thank you. Chuck DeShazer and then Jennifer Esposito. Hello, I'm Chuck DeShazer from Topak, Arizona. I uh, would like to speak on two issues today, if I 
I'm able to get to them. One being that uh, I'm not against abatements in any shape, manner, or form as long as they're done correctly. What I've placed up here is an example. You can see there's vehicles sitting in this yard. There's over 200 square feet of open lot storage. There's uh, obviously a shed that's built too close to a uh, side property line, which violates, those are just three or four violations in there. And what I'm getting at is in the uh, item 60 later today, in the background information, I was able to find something that just came up. It says, except as provided in other regulations, including the Mojave County Zoning Ordinance, no inoperative or unlicensed motor vehicle shall be parked, kept, or stored on any premises. No vehicle shall at any time be in a state of major disassembly, disrepair, or in a process of being stripped or dismantled. And why I bring that up is these vehicles here have no engines in them. And the reason I'm bringing this up is as you can see, the properties on either side of it are fairly clean. This property that I'm pointing out belongs to uh, the chief building official. For over a year, he uh, had to go home every day and see violations and never wrote himself up. I've asked for a uh, freedom of information on what violations have showed up on his property because I've made, according to him, three complaints, all is unfounded, and uh, only one shows up as unfounded. Uh, the other two don't even show up, and this went on for over a year that he didn't even violate himself. So how would we expect him running for Supervisor Bishop's position to continue to do a job if we elect him to it, if he's not doing his job now. Um, the other issue that I uh, came here about was brought forward by my wife. She's looked into it and would like me to uh, bring up, she wasn't able to be here today, um, so she'd like me to read. Today I'd like to ask that when uh, a supervisor is unable to attend in person, not only in their voice, not only is their voice heard, but their live image pinned to the main screen in the corner as a picture in picture during the entire meeting. It's available on Zoom. Uh, uh, if you are using Teams as your platform here, the host or the administrator can do this. It was never my thought, but one person told me they were concerned about AI when they can only hear a voice and not see a person. Authenticity is gained when you can see a visual recreation uh, to items being discussed. If there's any reason why we residents can't see and hear all of our supervisors, whether they attend in person or remotely, please let us know. On that subject, I'd like to let you know that uh, I've probably attended and been in this room more often than Buster Johnson in the last three to five years. So I'm willing to provide a monitor if you want to put it as chair so that you guys can show us so that we can get facial recognition or know that he's not sleeping during the, uh, you know, call to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jennifer Esposito and then Scotty McClure. Thank you, Jennifer Esposito, candidate for District 4 County Supervisor. Uh, the thing on the screen, that is the Red Cross pamphlet that is given out to the illegals as far down as the Darien Gap in Panama, telling them how to breach our, our borders. So I'm going to uh, also ask that you uh, deny giving them free storage. Kick them to the curb. They are clearly aiding and abetting the enemy. We don't know who they're giving this to. It, I could make it bigger, but it wouldn't matter. It's not written in English, so I just wanted to... to point that out to you. Um, also, I want to say that grant-funded travel is not free. 
because if the grant was so darn important that you had to enter into all of the entangling fine details of it, then by using grant funded money for travel, you're taking that money away from the taxpayers that you thought the grant was so important for to begin with. So in that spirit, I would like to oppose items 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. I would also like to oppose item 31. Um, I have concerns about what that might lead to in the future. Um, and I want to mention, um, with the Golden Valley Improvement District, in December of 2022, I believe it was December 5th, this board approved money for the well, which is now covered with uh, ARPA money as well. The total budget for the project is $2.2 million. Now, the bid came in at under $1 million, and I'd like to remind the board that I've asked you already, $562,900 of that money belongs to GVID and was swept from the GVID bank account. It's not needed. You need to return it to the people of GVID so that the financials no longer make us look like we're broke when we shouldn't actually be broke. Um, also, I would like to um, state publicly and unapologetically that if you are an elected official in Mojave County or you are a member of either the Democrat or Republican Party and you do not avail yourself of those links that Mr. Forrester mentioned, then you are a, and I'm re-quoting myself, complete and total idiot. Because I said that in the private MCRCC group, and uh, it was taken out of context by my opponent, Don Martin, and posted publicly on social media that I said, if you don't attend meetings. And what I said was, if you knew about this meeting, you had the ability to be there, and you chose not to go, then yes. You know, I, I, and I will stand by that statement. If you choose to ignore election integrity, you are a complete and total idiot. Because it is, is the one thing that it protects every other right and priority that we have. If we cannot have security in our elections, and I'm not just talking about the hand counts, because there are multiple vectors of vulnerability, electronic poll books, and the, the, uh, admin system, and all of the stuff that we're, I hope, going to discuss, because I signed up to speak on that. And, um, I would just like to say that I posted a video, and, uh, Supervisor Lingenfelter posted a laughing emoticon in my comment with the video, so apparently he doesn't take it seriously. And then Jean Kench. Scotty from Bullhead, and I'm really the reason why Jenny's leaving. Uh, she usually gives me four minutes, too. Um, Hilda, you crossed the line the other day at the Bullhead City Council meeting. By an one, I'm going to please ask you to listen. As I'm going to make charges today at the Sheriff's Department, you either resign today by the end of this meeting. I've already made charges at the Bullhead Police Department, as you might know if they knocked on your door yesterday. I'm charging you with premeditated assault and battery on me at the city council meeting. That's senior abuse, disabled abuse. And then you got the audacity to get up in your three minutes and accuse me of hitting you. Where's the blood? Where's the black eyes? Well, I have you on camera. That's on that camera there at City Hall on Channel 4. We have you pictures at the meeting at Los Lagos. And D.K. McDonald shot about 20 pictures of you with no black eyes or anything. I have 50 witnesses in that meeting. Um, you're just something else. I guess I'm your newest enemy. So you got a, uh, you grabbed me like a, when I start. I just couldn't, you were wagging your finger at me like that, right in my face. Because you were pissed off about something I said about Jamie or whoever in the heck it is, the Democrats. And you come there premeditated, so it fumed you all day. And you come after me, so that's premedication. To assault me. You have changed. I've had a lot of people on my Facebook. Remember when you suggested that you serve as chairman? She about bit your head off. She's changed in the last year. And I think you've all noticed it. I think everybody up behind me here has noticed it. The audacity for you to say is just, that's mental. I've never even been close to hitting a woman. I was brought up proper not to do that, to hit women. 
Thank God for my parents bringing me up right. And for you to lie right in front of the whole city council. Why wasn't I arrested? The chief of police is right there. Because there was no blood, no black eyes, no nothing. You weren't laying on your ass on the floor. It's called a camera, and you're caught lying. You have crossed the line. I'm going to the sheriff's department if you don't resign by the end of this meeting. Got it? You crossed the line, Hildy. Thank you, Mr. McClure. Jeannie Kench. Chairman, board, how are you today? Today's Mojave Minute will focus on some bill movement at the legislature. Senator Borelli, Representative Biasucci, and Representative Gillette have been hard at work moving bills forward to help everything from home ownership, election integrity, government policy, and thankfully, deed fraud. With Representative Gillette's assistance, the House has been successful in a couple of bills that we hope will result in approval from the Senate, then on to the governor. HB 2581, the physical presence bill, is defining Arizona residency. Believe it or not, there was zero definition of what was required to be an official Arizona resident, just your intent to stay. This bill will help the assessor's office with clarification for rentals. It will help with the vehicle registration department and even the voter registration. This bill passed the House and transmitted to the Senate on February 28th. 2588, which is HB 2588, relating to notaries and sponsored by the Secretary of State's office. This bill requires a thumbprint from not only those being notarized, but the notary themselves. If passed, this will help strengthen conveyances, reducing deed fraud. This bill was passed at the House and transmitted to the Senate on February 22nd. And HB 2405, damaged property grace period. This bill originated in Coconino County, allows property owners their loss of homes through fire, flood, or an act of God to be given more years to rebuild prior to reclassification. Those are just a few bills, special bills, that I'm focused on and are important to the assessor's office. There is always give and take with bills. Sometimes it's the only way to get clear sailing across the finish line. The common denominator for all successful bills is to work hard communicating with all legislators, expect compromise, and stay alert when committees request the possible opposition. Thank you again for allowing me a few moments to share the Mojave Minutes. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close the call to public. Uh, we have a proclamation. Proclamation declaring the month of March 2024 as Procurement Month and March 13th, 2024 as Professional Buyers Day in Mojave County. Mo motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We have another presentation on the status of electronic plan review by Mojave County Development Services and Mojave County Information Technology Departments. Madam Chair, before we get into that, may I make a statement? I was mentioned during the call. Oh, yes. I'd Go like right to make ahead. a statement if I could. Yes. Um, to those that are leaving, um, I just want to say that I respect your advocacy and um, this is a tough choice and we're still watching what happens with it. Um, for District 1, MEC does have a service territory that includes Wikia, Val Vista, Peach Springs, all the way up to the Wallapai Tribe. Um, I hope that uh, they do find a suitable location and I hope everybody understands that, that zoning is just the first step in a, in a long process, that the site planning process comes after the zoning. And I, I wanna make sure that um, that site planning process includes pretty robust mitigation to the noise and any other concerns that you guys have. Um, I want to offer that up. I also want to talk about the COVID-19 response. Um, that was mentioned by a speaker. I wanted on record that in 2020, as the Vice Mayor of Kingman, I was the only member of that body to stand for medical freedom of choice in 2020 against the shutting down of private businesses. I actually pushed a parklets program here in Kingman and I out of my own pocket uh, funded the first parklet to make sure that our downtown businesses in Kingman would not close. That they had, you could only have 50% indoor seating and you had to have 50% outdoor seating. Um, I helped the wine bar out with the first parklet. I'm very proud about that. And my position on that has not changed. And then with the elections, uh, I just want to put it on record that um, 
I am a Christian. I have served in the U.S. Air Force. Um, I've been a car-carrying Republican since I was 18 years old. Um, the Arizona Constitution places the responsibility for our elections in this state squarely on the legislature. I hope everybody understands that. Uh, we had eight years of a governor that was Republican. I think the, the House in this state has been held by Republicans since 1961. I believe that the Arizona Senate has been held by the Republicans since 1991. Um, we had all three of those bodies um, occupied by Republicans in 2020, in 2021, in 2022. And my question to all of you is, um, without risking a Class 5 felony, as the, the counties would, for trying to monkey around, how come the state legislature, when it was all Republican-controlled, didn't fix these things? How come they didn't fix these things? We had it for 2020, 2021, and 2022, and they could have fixed it, and they didn't do it. And so to come and, and attack the counties, which don't have any control under Arizona's our constitution for our elections, um, I think it's very politically convenient to do that. I'd also like to ask those of you that are speaking out, um, our colleagues, uh, Cochise County Supervisors Peggy Judd and Com Tom Crosby, both have legal defense funds. I know that I have personally, out of my own pocket, donated to those legal defense funds. I would ask how many of you have also donated to those legal defense funds because they're facing Class 5 felony convictions right now. So with that, I yield. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, onward. Good morning, Chairman and Board. This presentation is going to be started off by our Director of Development Services, Tim Walsh. I believe he's on Teams, so he's going to begin the presentation. I'm going to drive it, and then when it gets to the section or area when there's potentially questions about technical aspects of things, I'm going to aid Mr. Walsh. Nathan, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the Board, thank you for uh, the time to share this, this uh, presentation with you. Um, as mentioned back in November, uh, we we let the, or we told the board that we'd be back uh, February in order to give you an update on this. We we're hoping to have our online permitting up and running at that time. We've hit a couple of snags, and, and we'll get into that a little bit more um, at, in this presentation. But uh, we should have this up and running here fairly soon, and 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 be able to to get that out out there for our our, our residents and our customers. Um, if I can, just a, a brief overview of, of what the, the program is. Online permitting, uh, we've been working on this for quite some time now. Uh, we've been working with IT and uh, and some of our vendors on in, improving our uh, our customer experience, helping our, our contractors, our uh, do-it-yourselfers, um, all of our residents be able to improve their experience with the county and, and make it as easy as possible on them. Um, online permitting is, is just one more uh, aspect of, of improving that, that customer experience. And our plan is uh, to be able to get this up and running so that one, our residents throughout the county, as, as you all are well aware, um, we have a very large geographic county and having this online permitting will allow them to be able to submit their applications anywhere in the county and, and not have to either mail it in or um, come into our office or um, wait for one of our uh, office days up on the strip in order to submit those. They'll be able to submit it um, in real time online and get that application reviewed right away. Um, on that's you know on the on the client side that's that's some of the major benefits on our side it also helps in being able to uh, manage our loads um, be able to shift our, our our workload from one office to another depending on on uh, what we see if you know if bullhead's got a, a large workload um, and Kingman's not as as buried we can send a lot of those things up to Kingman electronically and and basically in the end provide a better service for our customers. So that's our end goal with, with this entire project is to be able to better serve our customers. Um, just as a, a brief review on the program, our, our first phase um, is basically all of our over-the-counter permits. 
and that is our record types not requiring a, a plan review. Um, we do still review the applications, make sure they're complete, make sure they have uh, everything that they need, and review you know some of the the technical side of it. But it's a quicker review. Um, it's record payments. It also in, includes uh, some permits through environmental health and uh, some of the, the again, the over-the-counters for environmental quality. Um, this was actually we had up and running, um, but we had a couple of issues with, with payments. And, and uh, Nathan will go into that, I think, a little bit more is in his portion of it. But uh, due to some issues we were having, we had to take that down. So it was up and running back in November. Um, we saw a couple of technical issues. So we we brought it down in order to not have a, a larger problem on our hands and, and are, are working to fix that and should have that back up and running here fairly quickly. Um, the second phase is really the, the meat and potatoes of the program. This is our uh, residential plan review, our commercial plan review, um, septic, septic systems, pools, um, zoning permits, and, and all of those. These are the, the, the plans, you know, that really makes up the majority of our, our uh plan reviews day. Um, this is phase two, and, and basically this will allow any of our applicants to submit their plans online. We get them in, review them electronically, and then issue comments electronically as well. So um, really speeding up that process and, and you know, working that, that case management between our offices. The third phase then addresses our um, violation records, um, some of our more complicated septic systems, and then um, environmental quality complaints too. So our, our residents will be able to get online and, and provide the, the uh, location of these, these various um, violators. Um, we'll be able to um, get those in, that information, get, get out there, post the updates so that both uh, the the alleged violator will be able to see the status, but then also the person making the complaint will be able to see the status and and be able to see, hey, we are working on these. Um, sometimes that, that process uh, seems a little bit long um, when it's your neighbor that's that's got this this mess next door. So they'll be able to see where we are in that process. But just that that that's basically the the program and an overview. Um, we are working diligently, as I mentioned. Uh, we we've been working diligently with IT, and IT um, has been doing an outstanding job. Um, and with that, I, I'd like to turn the time over to Nathan to to kind of share some of the the accomplishments and, and challenges that they've faced as as they've worked to implement this. So thank you. timeline of this project has, has been, you know, fairly long. We, we began this project in 2022, middle of the year. And fast forward to today, we've had a lot of uh, time and energy devoted to really enhancing the services uh, that the county provides relative to this business process. You know, uh, as the CIO for the county, it's, you know, one of my major tasks to modernize our business processes as best I can. Uh, that requires a lot of coordination with the departments that I call the business process owners. Uh, IT doesn't make the decisions about these things. We coordinate with those departments that technically own those business processes. So Tim and his group have put a tremendous amount of time and effort and energy into reviewing these business processes so that we can automate them through the use of technology. Um, obviously, we're here today to give you an update on when we think we're going to be fully live. And I believe that timeline is March 18th. We're planning on being fully live with all phases of the project. Um, if there's questions or concerns about the delays and why uh, we've failed to meet some of the deadlines, we have some of that information in here. Uh, but, you know, I really want to focus on uh, delivering a message to, to you all that we are taking this project seriously. Staff at Development Services has been working uh, very hard to do the job at hand and do additional validation and testing. And this is not uh, a light project. It, it's something that it's easy to say, but it's, it's not as easy to execute. You know, when we say, let's do online job, online permit applications, sounds really easy. I wanted to highlight for all, everyone that's watching, uh, that equates to 172 record types in the system. And every record type requires testing and validation. So the amount of work and time and energy that it takes is, is sometimes overlooked. But the, 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 really positive message here is that we're making it you know we're really close to the finish line on this and 
I think uh, come March 18th, we'll have the ability for our citizens to apply for these permits online through the county website and uh, really significantly enhance the service that we're delivering to the citizens. Okay. Any questions for Nathan? Madam Chair. Yes. Nathan and, and uh, Director Walsh, if you're still with us, uh, thank you both for the presentation. Um, this project started, it looked like, in August of 2022. The first time that I put it on the agenda was in May of 2023. Um, and then also I have an item on uh, later in the agenda, just in case um, the board wanted to set an absolute final date for this um, with our county manager. But um, I'm pleased with the report. I think that a county of our size... Um, even though we're very geographically large, we should have a, a system like this already in place. Um, I think one of the best ways that we can hit the deficit is to make sure that we get a system like this in place. Uh, time is money for these projects. It keeps everybody on the same page, everybody that's involved, whether it be public health or or any other division of the department can concurrently review th plans. Um, all of the comments are in one spot. Um, there's not any searching around for where are my plans at. You can go on exactly and, and find out exactly where your project is. Hopefully it'll, it'll be a significant time savings and hopefully it'll help us with also some of the complaint stuff that we've seen um, testimony on in, in previous meetings too. So um, hopefully this does um, wrap up and, and get fully ro rolled out in March this, this month. Is that correct? Um, sure. Uh, I may just keep my item on um, and just ask the board to task our county manager with his leadership to make sure that it sticks. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Madam Chair. Yes. Mr. If Elkins. I may, just really quick, I, I want to really point out that staff started this project with an eye on the end of it, and which would enhance and improve permitting. Um, they've uh, had to deal with different existing systems and softwares, um, had to uh, experience challenges with types of payments, uh, but they have all along made the effort necessary to align them all together to produce a system that is not going to frustrate, but on the other hand, to work for our industry, uh, residents and contractors alike. So. I I understand the sense of urgency, and the staff has to honestly, and we thank you sincerely for your patience, but I think you will be proud of it when it's done, and, and when it does go live, a significant amount of time and energy has gone into it, and I think you will be pleased when you see it in action. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Director Walsh, I just wanted to make sure that our citizens would still be able to turn in paper blueprints also. Madam Chair, Supervisor Gould, absolutely. We'll, we'll have that available um, definitely for our, especially for our um, owner builders and, and the, the, your do-it-yourselfers, those guys. Um, we definitely will, will make sure that we can accept those paper plans. Anyone else? Thank you, Nathan. And thank you, Mr. Walsh. All right, the consent agenda. The following items listed on the consent agenda will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion with no separate discussion of said items unless a board member so requests. Supervisor Bishop. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've been asked by three constituents to poll item 31 um, in regards to how this might benefit the community. So I shall do that. Okay. Supervisor Leinfelter. Nothing, Madam Chair. Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Items 12 and 39. Okay. Supervisor Johnson. Nothing, Madam Chair. Okay. I have a bunch of people signed up for a lot of items, um, and they would be 39 to 43. So that's 39. 40, 
I'm sorry, Madam Chairman. Yeah. So these 52, 54, 50, those are all public hearings. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So sorry. Um, so wait, wait, where does it stop? Uh, the, the consent agenda items stop at item 50. 50. I'm sorry. In my head, I was thinking 60. Okay, so sorry. All right. So I need a motion to approve consent agenda items minus 12, 31, 39, 40, 41, 42, and 43. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Item number 12, Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, apparently, let's see, this is risk management. Madam Chair, Supervisor Gould, is there, is there some specific questions you'd like to, to know about this, or do you want me to give you an overview? Why don't you give us an overview? Fair enough. Yeah. So in 2022, the board approved um, uh, for the Red Cross to be able to utilize some space up at uh, 3675 Sunshine, which we share that building with them in risk and emergency management, really on the emergency management side. Uh, that we use as a d department operations center. Up there, we store lots of uh, supplies, equipment, things that are associated with emergency res response. Right now, um, since 2002, they have a small office there. They have a, uh, they'll occasionally use a training room that we'll, they'll share with us. It's a real small training room, but really dedicated to them as a small office, small storage space. The, uh, their operations right now uh, involve uh, being able to respond if there is a disaster in the area. Keep in mind there's only, I, I believe at the current time, there's two Red Cross volunteers in the area. The closest uh, other response is going to be from Flagstaff or Prescott right now. So the resources they have in there um, include things like COTS, which they can, if there are uh, places or, or, or incidents that require some sort of displacement of people, um, to be able to open a shelter, they do maintain uh, agreements with the schools and things like that to be able to open those shelters, which is not uh, something that's within our capacity at this time. They, they're able to, to do that for approximately 100 people. Um, the big benefit for us is that if we do have something happen in the county, um, they're in our building. We're, we're operating in that department operations center. We have a close tie with them to be able to do what we can with minimal staffing and resources in that area. In addition to that, the, uh, on a regular basis, and when I say that, I believe it's fair to say weekly, if, uh, if there are people in the county and they could be in the incorporated or unincorporated areas that that are displaced as a result of a fire they they may be meeting with these families to try to make sure that their needs are met they have a place to go sometimes that's through vouchers um, and sometimes that's just getting them clothing some things like that so that's that's what they do and they operate there um, in addition to that space on the inside on the outside they also um, uh, keep a, a, a trailer and also one other vehicle that's within closed gates um, from that standpoint. We we do train them in, in being able to access um, uh, those areas. Um, they, uh, they do provide us with insurance, um, just like anybody else would. Uh, and so that's, that's a brief overview of, of that. If you have some specific questions about it, I'd be more than glad to answer them. What's the, what are we getting for rent? There is, there is no rent now. We, it's, we, we offer them that space for that. Um, uh, I, and I guess if you want to consider it some sort of benefit for us to be able to be able to tie in closely with them as they are a disaster response, you know, entity that that's what we do as well. And so there is no, there is no monetary rent that's changing hands. Do we know what the fair market rent would be if we were to charge some rent? Um, I can't, I can't tell you that we've done that in an analysis. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Madam Chair. Supervisor Lingenfelter. I've got a question. I would say, at the very least, um, if this is approved, I'd like to see it sent with a letter requesting that they 
cease with the practice of of providing illegal immigrants with maps about how to get here. Um, I've seen I've seen a map that the Red Cross g- gives out where it shows r- routes on how to come here. Um, so at the very least, take off the Arizona routes. I mean, that doesn't seem to be helping us. Any anyone else? Was that that wasn't a question? Was that a question? That's just a statement. Um, I, I have a question. It's about a year ago. Somebody um, that I know from Facebook, uh, their their house caught on fire, and um, you know they called me because they said that nobody was coming. Like they called and the Red Cross was supposed to come, and by the time the Red Cross came, they Red Cross gave them a blanket and left. Nothing else. So do we kind of monitor this kind of emergency um, um, response from them? Do, is there any sort of measurement that we use to make sure that they're giving the service that they're supposed to be giving? Because I think at the end of the day, I, I got the guy to another, yeah, to another nonprofit organization that was able to give him what he needed. So, you know, I, I know that this is, I understand what this is, but uh, I'm not fond of this organization either. Okay. I can't, I can't vouch for it, whether it confirm or deny what you just reported. Uh, the, what, the one thing that we do is we do try to, we, we try to push that organization to have more than two volunteers in the area uh, because, as, as you can understand, that that's, that's not much for resources in the area and so we do we do try to push that we don't govern them if that's what you're asking when there's a red cross response for a fire or something like that Mm -hmm. is 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 there any cost to the county for that no no there's not we, and so when we I don't say, contract with them for emergency yeah. Ma- madam chair and, and so when i say that uh you know we 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 push over in to to the their their management area over yeah out of prescott that they get on that because we've got concerns uh about you know what capacities that are there uh and so we 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 do reach out and say, hey, listen, what can we do in this area? Is there any ability to recruit for the volunteers? But keep keep in mind, it is an all volunteer, you know, right. organization from that standpoint. I say all volunteer. Obviously, you know, at at certain levels, it's not all volunteers. Right. Right. So, but but the the people and the folks that are in this area, they are. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Motion to deny. Second. I have a motion and second to deny. All in favor of the Madam. denial. What? Would you like to say something? Sure, if I may. Sure. Uh, just that in emergency response situations, we do work with them. Um, they, the space that they have with us provides them a presence. I think in the long run, that's, that offers us as a county more value than not having them in here. So as you contemplate okay. uh, a decision to provide them that space or not, please do keep that in mind. I think there's value to our county residents. I think we need to open it up and, and find uh, a better a better response organization. But we have a, uh, a motion and a second to deny. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Okay, three to two motion carries for denial. Item 31. Uh oh. This was, I believe, uh, Supervisor Bishops. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. I moved, did the wrong Acknowledgement abandonment application proposal for property owners of APN 306 31009, High Desert Land Holdings. Supervisor Bishop. Angus, if I could get Steve Lukowski to uh, come down and just give a summary. Uh, apparently, some of my constituents want to know the reason to abandon a road and what benefit that might have to the uh, residents out there. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Supervisor Bishop. Uh, this represents the uh, first step in the abandonment process by which staff is bringing the uh, applicant's petition to the board for an acknowledgement and a referral back to staff proposal is high desert holding 
they own two lot, uh, two parcels uh, totaling 70 acres uh, with the uh, intent as uh, per uh, preliminary submittal. Uh, they're proposing to develop what's called uh, Midway Estates. It's a uh, subdivision of about 276 lots. And this particular right-of-way for La Osa Road is undeveloped, uh, has not been uh, graded or built out, but it bisects the two parcels. So it uh, literally, uh, you know, uh, uh, the action, the intent of the developer or, developer or property owner in this case is to abandon La Osa so that they can prepare and present um, and subsequently get approval for a plat uh, to develop this subdivision midway estate. Okay, that explains it to me. We have growth in Golden Valley, and I don't think we can um, realistically stop the growth. And if we can have controlled growth, I think it's a good thing. Do we have anybody that signed up that wants to speak to this? That's a 31. Okay, with that, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 39, approve the intergovernmental agreement with the Secretary of State's office to authorize Mojave County's portion of the maintenance contract of the statewide voter registration database for FY24 in the amount of $23,199.98. We have um, Jennifer, Anitz, uh, Jennifer Esposito and then Brett Forrester. Thank you, Jennifer Esposito, candidate for District 4 County Supervisor. Um, we should not have uh, done the last payment on this contract with Eric Avid database system. Um, it's not a requirement, but I have serious concerns uh, regarding the security of outsourcing our uh, system in light of the presentation given by Mr. Mark Cook in Mojave Valley on uh, uh, a little over a week ago, uh, he went into great detail about uh, this being one of the vectors of vulnerable vulnerability. But one of the things that happens when you outsource your database is that you give bad actors uh, access to the data. They know who's on the early voting list. They know when they voted their early ballot. They know if they didn't vote an early ballot that that's a voter that uh, could be ripe for one of those mysterious things to just, uh, oh, look, we found an extra ballot that, I don't know, maybe. I, I have a, a friend, I think some of you know her, Penny Holden. She lived, she's lived at her house for 14 years, and only last year did she start receiving, I think it was um, several ballots for a previous homeowner that she didn't request that somebody doesn't live there anymore. But what happens is, is, Bad actors have the ability to to sort of harvest these, uh, they now call it the able ballots and things like that, where they can calculate by outsourcing this voter database, they can calculate how many registered voters on the able system are, are have not voted. And then they can try and find ways to manipulate that. What you have is you have a ceiling of registered voters, and then you have people who actually vote. I believe it's 78% in the general, about 58% in the primary. I could be wrong on that. But you have like about a 20% margin in there, and that's where bad things can happen. I'm not saying they're happening here. I'm saying there are issues coming up that are raising concern. So there's nothing to stop Mojave County from maintaining its own records and submitting them to the Secretary of State but particip you know, at, at some point, but participating in this updated outsource system I think is just adding another layer of vulnerability. And so um, I would urge you to uh, deny renewal of this contract because I do think that it, it opens us up as we well know um, even the Department of Justice I think the FBI all these people have been hacked so we talk about cybersecurity but you're basically giving uh, you know an, an out, a party outside of your control access to all of our information whether they use it legitimately or whether they use it nefariously who has access to that the minute you do that it, it's all out of our control and I think that um, we really do, in order to instill confidence, in order to make that 
that differential between registered voters and people who actually vote higher to reduce that ceiling, we need to show them that, th that we're taking proactive steps to secure our elections. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Forrester. Madam Chair, board members, once again, I can't say it much better than what uh, Ms. Esposito had to say. I repeat, um, with the handcountroadshow.org and uh, Mr. Mark Cook, he does not just talk about and, ex and explain what some of the issues are. He gives you the tools, the examples, and the understanding of just exactly how this happens. Happens. So part of what, in, a, in addition to what um, Ms. Mrs. Esposito was talking about, has to do with balancing of numbers. So... You can't have 120% of something that only 80% is real. And yet, that's exactly what happens. So in these lists that get analyzed by a third party, they're able to farm that out to different groups that they know can come in, show that, oh, look, all, uh, b b list A or pile A matches pile B must be okay. And that's not okay because there's there's no there's no forensics that goes into that because there's no mechanism for that. And in uh, rebuttal to understanding that at the at the county level we don't have the ability as board of supervisors to install trust in our local vote because it's at the state level does not mean that we do not have a voice that we cannot state our opinions and that we cannot back those opinions up with numbers and facts. So I encourage you to please watch these videos. Please take them in. This is not some, whole, you know, donkey show. Okay. And um, with that said, have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's all who signed up for the item 39. Do I have a motion? Madam Chairman. Yes. I continue to have problems with the county farming out its voter registration list. Um, I think that this list is precious, that we should hold it close to our chest, and it shouldn't be available to um, third parties. If you do a public record, records request of run back, they'll tell you to pound sand. They will not get, tell you what they did because they didn't claim that they're a third party. They don't have to comply with open record requests. Um, but I think that we should be doing this ourselves. I thought this there was an earlier issue about two months ago that I thought we, that we should do it ourselves. I continue to think that we should do it ourselves. I've read uh, 16168. It, that does not require that we participate in this program. It just spells out the things that we need to do when we turn our list over to the Secretary of State. But I think this is just something that we can do as a county to tighten up our voter roll. And I think that we should move to in that direction rather than turning these things over to a third party. Thank you. Does uh, I see Lydia Durst there. I wonder if she has something to offer about that suggestion. Good morning, Madam Chair, members. Um, for item number 39, we've had this in the past. So... This is the Arizona Voter Registration Information Database, and it is held through the Secretary of State's office, and this funding pays the Secretary of State for all the maintenance that is required. Um, when we had the new laws for 2024 to have a voter record be, or a voter be able to follow their ballots from sent to received to accepted pending, anything like that, um, this funding assists in paying for that. Um, I would like to add that um, the JBLC, the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, has put in to reimburse 12 out of the 15 counties all of the funding um, to pay for this for the next few years. So this is a budgeted item, but it would be fully reimbursed by JBLC. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Supervisor Lingenfelter. Thank you. Um, Recorder Durst, looking at the backup documentation, the estimated fiscal year 24 AVID costs for the state are $1.3 million. And we, Mojave County, is being asked to pay 3.75% of that $1.3 million cost for a total 
of $146,385. Is that, or, or no, that's, um, really, is it uh, quarterly? It says here $23,199, but in the backup documentation it shows, oh, okay, no, okay. So we're only being asked to pay just under 4% of the total cost. Um, what what um, do you think it would cost us? Have you done any work at all? Maybe not to, to have our own county system. Certainly not 1.3 for the whole state, but I mean, it's going to be significantly more than just $23,000. Um, I'm not saying that it's a bad idea, but it's something that would certainly need to be planned for and programmed. Correct. So Maricopa and... Uh, Pima County do have their own voter registration records, but they are databases, but they still have to pay AVID cost because all of their data still has to be transported into AVID. So on that same page there, Maricopa still has to pay $381,000. Pima still has to pay $99,000 a year because you have to still input all of that data into the AVID database. So what you're saying is no matter what system an individual county creates at their own expense, they would still have to make sure that the system that they create is compatible with the AVID system. And there may be some sole brand type of technology or something. I'm, I'm not an IT guy. I don't know. It's, yeah, the systems have to talk to each other, right? Yes. And so they still have to pay? They do. So would we save... So the, I don't know. We, won't, we won't get into that. Well, JBLC um, isn't paying for... Maricopa, Pinal, or Pima County for reimbursement, but they'll pay everyone else for reimbursement. So it comes out of the taxpayers' pockets, but then it's reimbursed. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it'll come from general fund, and then it'll be fully reimbursed. And it's been confirmed that five counties so far that have paid, they've received 100% reimbursement. Okay, thank you very much. I have no more questions. What, what is the purpose of a statewide database like what what do they just for so everyone knows what do they use it for so it's the voter registration database when someone completes a voter registration paper form it comes to our office five out of the voter registration specialists are going to input all that data it's everything from your name to your driver's license your date of birth your mother's maiden name, all the questions on your voter registration form are inputted by our office, and then you become a registered voter in Mojave County. If you want to move from Mojave County to Coconino, it's going to just carry that record with you. Um, so you're always going to have your voting history in the state of Arizona, although you may move to different counties. Um, we are a bottom-up state with voter registration. We do all the voter registration in-house. Uh, we signature verify everything here. Um, Mojave County completes their own early voting locations for vote, um, early voting in person locations. Um, everything is done by us, it's just bottom up. Okay. Madam Chairman. Yes. Um, if you look in deeper into the backup, this data is transferred to Sutherland Government Solutions, Inc. Um, and I N E X L Consulting LLC, um, and I'm not sure where where it says we have to participate because it's certainly not in 16168. I don't know if Recorder Durst knows where's it, where what statute requires us to participate in AVID. We have to turn our data over to the Secretary of State, but we don't necessarily have to pay these folks to do it. We can do it ourselves. I don't have the seat statue in front of me. Um, I believe it is within HAVA since 2020 or 2002 um, that everyone is supposed to be with the Arizona Voter Registration Database or um, just the Arizona Voter Record by the Secretary of State because we joined AVID in 2019. Um, in Excel and Summerlin, they were the creators of this database, and they um, is it's essentially who the Secretary of State is paying because they created the database. If that answers your question, it does not. <laughs> um, um, I'm not. I'm not. It wouldn't be in that statute, and it's not in sixteen one sixty eight. Um. It might be in HAVA. HAVA is not a is is a federal thing. It is not a state thing. Right. 
Um, so I don't know if HAVA requires us to do to do that or not. But you are turning the data over to um, looks like two third parties, which makes it double problematic to me. I have no pro if we have to turn it over to the Secretary of State. We don't have any choice in that, and what they do with it, we have no control over. But I don't know that we have to willingly participate in a system that turns our data over to um, to private company. And, Marico and like she said, Maricopa, Maricopa and Pima don't even participate in this. And I'd rather, frankly, I'd rather pay and not participate than to pay and participate. That's how strongly I feel about it, uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Just a couple things. Looking at, at uh, 16, the statute that uh, Supervisor Gould cited here, 16.168. Um, there's a lot of information on this, but I'm going to boil it down to really Section 7. Section 7 says that the, the, the Secretary of State has to develop and administer a statewide database. They have to do that. And so to do that, they've, they've utilized these third-party vendors to create that. And there's a cost to maintaining it, keeping it up to date, doing firewalls, everything else that comes with any kind of software. So that's that's the process that they do that. That's required by statute that they have to do this database. The relevant part here, at least to answer some of the questions here, it says as part of the statewide voter registration database, county recorders shall provide for the electronic transmittal of that information to the Secretary of State on a real-time basis. So we have to participate in this. We, we do. We could do our own. It sounds like I didn't know that other counties did their own, but we do have to participate in this. And there's, some, there's just some benefits to participate in this because, as you know, people move. People change records, they, they update, they, they go from different parties. And so they're trying to do that as quickly as possible and try to get it as, so that as, as people are moving and changing things, that, that'll still stay as, 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 you know, as, as, as up to date as they possibly can. I, I think Supervisor Gould is correct. I, there's nothing in the statute that says we have to pay for it. Um, I, I remember when this came through a couple of years back, and, and really it's just a matter of, who's going to pay for it. And it's a question of, okay, can the counties help pay for some of it? And so that's what this request is really is, can the, can the counties help pay for some of it? They found a, they, they said, okay, we're going to base it based on the number, the population. If you look in the back up there, you know, we have this many percentage of registered voters, so that's how much that they've asked. But I, I think most importantly is um, that we're going to be reimbursed for it. Yes. So if we're paying for it, we're going to get reimbursed for it. So if you deny it, it's not going to change the fact that there's still a, a statewide database. It's not going to change the fact that, that we're going to be participating in it. Um, I, can't answer the I cannot answer the question of why we have to pay for it. I can't. I, I just I can't. But I, I will say that this seems like a fair a way to, to distribute this burden upon everybody, all the counties throughout the state, and uh, so that way, you know, one county isn't paying more than the other. Um, and again, because it's being reimbursed, uh, I don't see why you wouldn't want to do this. Anything else? No, M motion to deny. And we have a motion to deny. Any second for the motion to deny? Hearing none, motion fails. Motion to approve. I need a second. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I, I'm an aye too. Opposed? No. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Perhaps we could talk about this for the next, I just, it's just so close to the election now. Maybe we can bring this back up. Uh, at a future meeting. Um, the next one will be 40, 41, 42, 3. We have one person signed up at Ms. Esposito. He's just uh, issues. As uh, Ms. Esposito is coming up, I believe these other ones are actually not voter related. These are recorder related. <laughs> I know that. So. I know that. 
Thank you, Jennifer Esposito. First, I would like to say that uh, I think Lydia has done a very good job in putting the records of the county recorder's office online in a digital format that the public can double check and research and whatnot, which is, has just been wonderful. It's amazing how many documents are on that file that say Lingenfelter. Uh, <laughs> I've been having some fun with that. But um, my concern here is again the difference between submitting everything electronically versus having physical hand signed ink on paper copies of records and, and I'm not suggesting that there's anything particularly nefarious in this I realize that there are some um, guidelines 300 dpi and, and so on and so forth with these liens and these titles and these other recorded documents but I have serious concerns about electronic submissions because there's nothing really to stop someone from taking a physical document and um, running it through, you know, scanning it, running it through Photoshop and uploading a, an altered document to the, to the website uh, through these trusted partners or, or non-trusted partners or anything else. But I think that, um, that they're, you know, I'm not trying to come off as a bit of a Luddite, but I think that for the um, liability on the county for records being accurate, there is something to be said about having people submit actual signed notarized documents in physical form to the county recorder and then having the county recorder make their own digital copy rather than having third party vendors outsourcing. And this, this is, goes for all of the items, so I won't speak on all of them individually visually, you know, in the interest of time. But I'm just saying that I appreciate that she's doing this as an attempt to save the taxpayers money. But I, th you know, as Supervisor Gold pointed out, when you have third parties, they're not subject to public records requests and things. I just think that this is something that the county recorder's office should handle in-house, that they should accept physical documents with, you know, not not wet ink, but actual ink, you know, dried on the paper, where you know that, yes, that is an actual legitimate stamp from a, a notary. Yes, that is an actual physical signature of, signature of the person. You just, just to cover your liability that the document that are recorded are the original documents. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what's the pleasure of the board? Is Chairman this something Angus. we're doing already or is this a new program? Supervisor Gould, we have been accepting electronic documents for about 16 years. Um, we have five vendors, all five, there's four here, one I'm waiting on the agreement from. Um, they just haven't been updated in about 10 years, so I'm just bringing them back to the board. There's no place for the board to sign on these MOUs, um, but just to have uh, transparency. These vendors, um, are typically who title companies use to e-record all documents. 70% of our recordings come from e-recording vendors, such as these four. Um, we don't receive any additional funding from them. The ven they receive funding to submit each, each document, depending on how much that title company is going to submit through them. They charge them for submission, but we don't receive anything besides the $30 state statute fee. So the title company pays the third party? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Any other questions? I make a motion to approve item 40. Second. We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Discussion. Aye. Oh, you, need to, you want discussion? I'd like to make a point since yes. the speaker uh, mentioned me by my last name. Um, I have no doubt that there's a lot of documents with the last name Lingenfelter, my grandfather was the fourth doctor in Mojave County, um, was the greatest entrepreneur and philanthropist that the Kingdoms ever had. And when, they, when he passed away in 2012, the paper here ran a story that said that we lost his greatest philanthropist. So he did a lot of business here. So that's why his name's on everything. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 41. Approve the memorandum of understanding between e-recording partner network and the Mojave County Recorder's Office. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Uh, any discussion? We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 42. Approve the memorandum of understanding between Corporation Service Company and the Mojave County Recorder's Office. I make a motion to approve. Second. 
We have a motion and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 43, approve the memorandum of understanding between Data Services, Inc. and the Mojave County Recorder's Office. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That is it for, I believe, for the uh, consent agenda. We'll be going to public hearings, but I think we should take a 10-minute break. Oh, Supervisor Gold? Yeah. My apologies that you had to read six.
going to call this meeting back to order. We have public hearings. Number 51, I'm opening the public hearing, discussion possible action to approve the adoption of the Board of Supervisor Resolution number 2024-064. Is there anyone who'd like to speak to this? Anyone would like to speak to item 51? Hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Madam Chair. Yes. This is my district. I'm going to make a motion to approve BOS resolution number 2024-064. Do I have a second? Second. We have motion second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Number 52, I'm going to open the public hearing. We do have somebody signed up, Amy Fonger or Funger. Come on down. I just want to start by saying thank you. Um, we uh, have this two and a half acres. I've been here for 12 years in this valley. I own a business, own a house on Glen Canyon where this is. And this is not a business we're doing. It is for people. Um, there's um, three of us, um, actually. And one is from Montana. Two of the, the other couple is from North Dakota. They have been coming down for 30 years. They've been robbed four times in 30 years. So we've done this kind of as a safety thing. Um, and Glen Canyon is a safe area for us. And most, uh, like me and two other people are, we're all gone back north in the summertime. Yeah, there's something. Oh, so, hello? Oh. Hello? Can you hear you? Who? Is that Supervisor Johnson? Please mute. <laughs> okay. Okay, go on. Anyways, uh, so we're only on the property for, like, maybe four months a year. I mean, I'm more so because I own a business here, but they're only here for four months out of the year. So anyway, that's all I need to say. And we just want to do everything right and make sure all the permits are in order. And like, I mean, there's so many in the Valley that it's insane okay. that they're not. So we just want to make sure that we are all in order. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Mm -hmm. Would anybody else like to speak to item 52? Item 52. Hearing none, I close the public hearing. Chairman Angus, I make a motion that we approve per staff recommendation. Second. Motion second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We've already done 53. 54, I'm opening up the public hearing for item 54, discussion possible action to approve or deny the adoption of the Board of Supervisor Resolution number 2024-067, an amendment to the Mojave County General Plan. I do have some people signed up. Stephen Pedroza, did I say that right? And after him, we have Logan Marsh. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Stephen Pedroza. I live at 10919 North Sharon Road, Kingman, Arizona, 86401. I own and operate Little Old Wine Drinkers Winery. We are catty corner from the five acres in question. And I would just like to speak today about the American dream. Um, I am there, and I had an opportunity 
to make my American dream, the dream that a lot of people in this room have succeeded in doing. It would be an ill-conceived idea that I would think that it should stop other people from conceiving of their dreams. I believe there is precedent to pass this. Five acres are currently zoned commercial for Stetson Winery. There are two special use permits within 200 yards of the proposed change. That would be Cella Winery and my own winery. We think it would be a great add to the area, give us an opportunity to have something to eat that we don't have to cook. Not that I'm afraid of cooking, but we would like the opportunity to have that. People have spoken of an increase in traffic through Valley Vista and on Brooks Boulevard. I think we need to be more concerned about the amount of traffic that will be generated by Angle Homes building 450 homes in Valley Vista Phase 2, or 3, I believe it's 3, that they have just built. 450 homes, I believe, a quick mathematical calculation, two cars per household, that's 900 cars a day. Nothing of that magnitude would be generated on, the, on Brooks Boulevard or in Valley Vista from the opening of this restaurant in a place where people want to live right next door to it. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Logan Marsh and then Patrick of Avila. Avila. Good morning, Supervisors, uh, Chairman Angus, thank you. Uh, my name is Logan Marsh. I um, live in uh, 917 South Emory Park, Golden Valley. I was at the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission um, and also spoke on this. Um, I was really disheartened to see the Commissioner's decision, but I hope that uh, we can rectify that here at the Board today. Um, I own quite a bit of parcels out in Valley Vista myself, uh, so I, I think this would be a great addition to the area, not only just for the wineries, but for, like Stephen said, the American dream. The people that are putting forth this idea of a restaurant, um, you know, a more fine establishment to eat in Valley Vista, because there, there really is nothing. They've got the golf course, they've got um, the pizza place, uh, the place outpost on 66 but nothing down towards the wineries nothing that's going to keep the tourism there keep the generation of of, of growth and uh, keep that area alive um, I'm in full support of it but to, to just speak on the behalf of the applicant um, I've grown to know them I don't know if anybody here knows but I own the Red Cellar and Bistro up on Wallapai and I love my community. I love Kingman. They've supported my uh, restaurant and kept us alive, uh, even through this really crazy political time where nobody can afford to even go buy toilet paper at Sam's Club. So the people that are putting forth this, um, this idea in Valley Vista, these are some of the most well-rounded people you'll come across. They're not only patrons at my establishment, but they're awesome members of the community um, I'd have you know that um, Anne volunteers her time at the American Legion, um, and she does get back to the community. And to see them and their dream grow to where they have their retirement plan in place to put together their restaurant, their dream, there's no reason why we should be saying no. So I'm in full support of this project, and I really hope that uh, you guys are in support too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marsh. Patrick Avila, and then Lee Barnes. Afternoon, I'm Patrick Avila. I live at 10688 North Benjamin Road, a couple miles away out in Valley Vista. I, I, I do personally know them, so I'm a little biased, 
but it puts another local business in that area. As of now, as I just said, there's only two restaurants, and I believe Mike's Outpost is supplied by one of the restaurants there as it is. At the Planning Commission, they said something about the alcohol license. The alcohol license is so you can sit down and have a drink of a glass of wine from the local wineries. It's there to help the wineries that don't offer food so the, the customers can stay out there and enjoy their time and get to know the areas better. Uh, they're building a home on the same property, so it's not like they're just building a business and living there. They're going to have a home on the property and their business as well. They're both honorably discharged veterans who are both intricate in the American Legion, which I am as well. Uh, they've owned the property out there a while. They've helped have the road installed out there. They are upstanding members of the community. Of the community. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Lee Barnes. And then Gail Davis. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and uh, board members. Excuse my voice. I'm speaking in opposition to it. The area out there is residential and agricultural. It's also free range. We have cattle out. I'm going to speak to the tradition also in this country where they put bars in commercial areas and not in residential areas. It's traditionally been that you put the bar where there's a commercially zoned place. It's different have sipping some wine and tasting it to, to decide whether to buy from the person who grew the grapes and made the wine. That's very similar to buying eggs from somebody who has raised, chick, raised their own chickens and produces eggs for consumption. People don't go to the wineries to get drunk and drive. People go to bars to drink. And having been out there in that area now for over 10 years, I've come to see that there are quite a few people who shouldn't be drinking after they drive, who are likely to end up out there. On any given day, you can see one cow or 15 or 20 cattle on Brooks or on Painted Rock Road. I don't see it as a benefit overall to the community, and it certainly isn't the lifestyle that I wanted. Having come as a reared as a boy in Texas, West Texas, and New Mexico. I like the cowboy lifestyle. I like the rural residential lifestyle. I retired from teaching college after 25 years to come here to avoid controversy and things like that. And here I am in the midst of it. Despite that, simply because I paid and I paid for a house in a residentially zoned area. I don't want a bar there. We don't need a restaurant there. We don't need more traffic through that area. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Gail Davis, <clears throat> and then the applicant, uh, Ann Senny. Good afternoon. My name is Gail Davis. I live on Brooks Boulevard. Um, just adjacent to where the proposed restaurant location would be. I'd like to thank you, Madam Chair, and the Board of Supervisors for this opportunity to speak in support of the proposed restaurant. My husband and I have been there since 2006, approximately 18 years, and since then we've seen many changes in growth in the area, including the Stetson Event Center and our local wineries, which we believe have all brought benefit, financial and social, to our community. And we also, likewise, believe that this restaurant would be a wonderful addition to our area. They would be providing upscale dining so that we could enjoy special occasions, so that we could maybe have a date night or a Sunday brunch. And it would be a great place to bring family and friends when they visit, rather than driving all the way to Kingman or even Lake Havasu City or Laughlin to spend our dollars. And I just want you to know that Anne and Steve, the, the proprietors, they're not outsiders looking to come in and make a change or take advantage or change our rural environment at all. 
As mentioned before, they've been living in the area for a number of years, and they do plan to build their personal residence right in the same location. But they would be bringing in their years of knowledge and experience in the culinary industry to provide a nice uh, special dining venue. And I know that some folks have voiced a concern about it being a bar, but it would not be a bar in the traditional sense, but rather give the patrons an opportunity to order locally produced wines and spirits to help in, uh, enhance their enjoyment of their meal if they so choose. So I hope that the Board of Supervisors will recognize the benefit socially, financially, and culinarily to our area by bringing in this restaurant. And I highly request that you would please grant their approval. Thank you. Thank you. And Senny. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, Supervisors, <clears throat> excuse me, and everybody who supports us. <laughs> um, just a couple of things I'd like to address from Mr. Barnes and anybody else who might have these concerns that he expressed, um, although they, they were already addressed briefly. Our bar is attached to the restaurant and bar license that we need to apply for. Um, if you've been to Matina's, you know that they don't have a bar. They have a place where the bartender pours drinks, but there's no place that people can belly up. And we will not have that either. Um, if someone wants a drink with their dinner, then absolutely. Um, nobody's addressed the tea room, but that's one of my pet things. And I really think I'm a tea snob. <laughs> and going to Las Vegas for afternoon tea just isn't... You know, I can do it, but why? And I think uh, a lot of people that I've talked to here would really appreciate having the opportunity to have afternoon tea in an area where they could also <clears throat> enjoy the local wine, beer, rums, mead that we, that we produce here in this area. Regarding the free range, open range issue, we're very aware of that. We've been, we've lived here um, over 20 years, we were made of, made aware of that when we first moved here. Even though we weren't, we were we're in town now. But knowing <clears throat> what is out there, uh, and it is all private property right now. Um, the cattle are allowed to roam and feed on private property as long as they can. Um, but if we're going to do farm to table kinds of foods and grow a lot of our own herbs and vegetables and fruits. We do need to make sure that the cattle don't think Ooh, buffet <laughs> and um, not give them access to that. So I uh, just want to say thank you for your consideration of our application and do I ask for questions now? Well, this is a public hearing. Okay. If, we, All right. if we'll call you back up if there are questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, is there anyone else who wants to speak to item 54? Come on down. Hello, my name is Nick Benson. I live at 10700 North Camp Belindo Lane out in Rancho or Mountain Vistas Ranches. I strongly oppose this. I moved here five years ago precisely because there was no bars or businesses or anything out there. A uh, the big concern is that it's all pitch black out there. Uh, I use a flashlight at night just to cross over my yard. And when people come in from out of town and it's pitch black out there, we have no street lights. We don't really want street lights. Uh, they're not going to be able to see the grazing cattle. The grazing cattle are not the concern of getting on our private property. They're concerned that they're out in the street and such and can cause accidents. We do not have any emergency services out there. I have with me a list of all of the uh, sheriff deputies in Mojave County. 
and it equates to about one sheriff deputy for every 1,200 square miles. That's not going to be able to handle any major accidents in a timely manner. We have no ambulance service out there. Uh, as far as not bringing in out-of-towners, this definitely will. This menu is definitely designed for something out of Westways magazine, such as Napa, California. Uh, I've never had any of my neighbors, and I have wonderful neighbors, I've never had any of them ask me, hey, Nick, let's go get some brie baked in crew with stone fruit jam. It just didn't. They have asked me about biscuits and gravy. Um, and then I had a conversation with Mrs. Sandy, and they mean very well. They're nice people. However, the, when I asked her how this restaurant's going to affect property taxes, she replied, aren't property taxes a necessary evil? Yes, they are. However, they aren't necessarily raised for no reason at all other than one person's dream. The rest of us are already living our dream out there. I do not want to deny them their dream, but why does the minority want to deny us our dream that we're already living? Uh, on my shared well alone, we have one lady who's working. She couldn't be here today because she's worked 70 hours a week. She just emailed me that she is one step away from homelessness. We have three widows whose husbands just died of COVID a couple of years ago. Their incomes went down 40%. You raise tax. Oh, we have another lady who's 80, who lives on Social Security. She wears a jacket all winter. She doesn't turn on her heater because she can't afford the electric bill. Yet, we're going to just unnecessarily raise property taxes for the dream of one people? I don't think that's right for anybody to move into an established neighborhood with an established lifestyle and decide that they're going to, that the rest of the neighborhood has to change to accommodate them. So in conclusion, I would ask you to please do not California our Arizona. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wants to speak? You've already spoken. We'll, we'll see when, after we close the public hearing. Anyone else wish to speak? See, seeing none, I'm going to, oh, is there somebody else? Okay, come on down. Hi, I'm Joe Stetson. Uh, I live at 6899 East Brooks Boulevard, Kingman, Arizona, 86401. Uh, when Don and I moved here, there was no Brooks Boulevard. Actually, my husband and a friend paid to have the uh, Brooks Boulevard cut in. It was a wash. And when it rained, it was a dangerous wash. I've seen people that be, would be in the middle of it, and they'd be spinning around. So I was here long before anything actually happened. We did build Stetson Winery, and Don passed away a couple of years ago. It's been very difficult. It still is. Uh, the Ann and Steve Saney are super nice people. They are true. Uh, inhabitants and their little 30 seat capacity restaurant will not cause much in the way of any kind of problems. Uh, it will be nice to not have to spend extra time and money to come into town to eat because there's no place out there to eat right now and they do have very nice food. Uh, it will be an addition to the area um, I don't know what else to say. I hadn't planned on speaking. Well, thank you. But thank you so very much. Okay. You will approve it because it's needed. Okay. Thanks again. All right. Anyone else? All right. I'm going to close the public hearing. I, I was neglect when I read the item that it was recommended denial by unanimous vote by our planning and zoning. So, um, is any, can we have someone from planning and zoning come up, pop up?
Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Walsh. Uh, just a, a little background, I guess, as far as from the Planning and Zoning Commission um, and from Planning and Zoning Department. Uh, staff did recommend denial on this item. Uh, reason being was it was uh, it was found to be uh, spot zoning. Um, there are no other C2 in the area, no other C2 zones in the area. There are some, as has been mentioned, there were some, or there are some of the uh, wine tasting rooms um, and, and vineyards out there. Um, those are CRE, which is uh, more of a, a, com a commercial recreation use. And those uh, are generally tied with those large agriculture, uh, where a restaurant is a C2 zone. Um, staff found that that would be uh, spot zoning as there's no other uh, commercial in the area other than those CREs. So uh, staff recommended uh, denial based on that. Um, commission agreed with it and, and did recommend um, denial as well. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Walsh? I would have one question for Mr. Walsh. Go right ahead. Director Walsh, um, I know our general plan is coming up for review here. Can you can you let me know when that is? Yes, sure. Uh, Madam Chair, Supervisor Lingenfelter, um, our general plan is up for review, and we're actually beginning that process. It is due in 2025. So uh, our our general plan is is reviewed and updated each every 10 years, and ours uh, is every based on the basically it, our next time will be 2025. So. That's when it comes before the board um, for a reapproval, and that's after considerable citizen input. Is that correct? That is correct. So it is a, a lengthy process. We're we're beginning to set up, uh, or basically, we're doing our planning, and we'll we'll be bringing that to the to the board for for review as well. Um, but we will be meeting in the various uh, communities to to look at um, what. You know what changes, if any, if any, need to be made uh, to the general plans to uh, meet citizen input. Um, we'll be making those, uh, take those recommendations, package them together. They'll go before planning and zoning commission, and then to the board. But yes, it, it's it's quite an extensive project uh, to uh, put together a general plan update. That's all the questions I have for Director Walsh. Yes, I, I have a question of Director Walsh. Uh, this is considered spot zoning. Have we done spot zoning in specific locations? And if so, uh, what type of circumstances allowed that? Madam Chair, Supervisor Bishop, um, general planning practice, we, we try not to do spot zoning. Um, and it, it's basically... You know, the general planning uh, practice, you want to have congruent uses, uh, compatible uses next to each other um, and and get that flow of, of various types of uses. Um, the board at times has approved uh, zones that, that staff would have, you know, recommended against, but the board has... Uh, a different view or a, a, a larger view, I guess I would say, you know, staff generally we look at um, specific on zoning and, and whether those uses are compatible. Um, the board may disagree with staff on whether certain uses are compatible. Um, the board may see a, a, a larger picture as far as um, wanting a, a certain area to have uh, what would be cons considered spot zoning. But in the end, um, the board approved uh, the zoning ordinance and and you know the the zoning maps. They they also approved the general plan. And therefore, if if the board finds that um, a certain use would be uh, well suited for a, a certain property, the board has that discretion to be able to approve it. Okay, um, I'm I'm thinking uh, along the lines of safety. Um, I go out to the wineries and, and have a glass of wine, and I might have two glasses of wine if, if there was an establishment like this in the area where I could uh, have some food before or, or after. Um, so I, I think it, I, I think they kind of complement each other. So um, 
I'm not sure maybe this is something we can look at at the um, 2025 general plan, but uh, the wineries as it sets now can can also offer food without the C2 zoning. So it's a little confusing. If the wineries can have special events and, and offer um, offer um, special dinners and, and uh, foods, I'm not sure that's a whole lot different than a 30-seat little restaurant in the area. So what what do you think about that? Can we get a special use permit, maybe? Oh, uh, Madam Chair, Supervisor Bishop, um, I guess what I, really it's up to the board's discretion on on whether or not this would be a, a good application. Um, if I may, I'll share my screen, and that might just to to share you know where staff where staff's recommendation is coming from. Um, so let's see if it's coming up. I don't know if you're able to see that just yet, but um, in the area, so there we go. Uh, the, the highlighted parcel is the, the proposed parcel. Um, down south, you have Valley Vista, um, and, and then this would, you'd, you'd basically continue up Painted Rock and then turn left on Brooks Boulevard. So the parcel highlighted there is, is the proposed parcel. You can see a few of the CREs um, in the area that are the vineyards. But, you know, in staff, looking at whether a, a C2 would be compatible use here um, and whether or not that would be uh, spot zoning. As you can see, we're, we're surrounded with, with a, a sea of, of rural development area. Um, and then many of the zones around there, AR, five-acre uh, minimum, for the for the most part or, or larger um so in, in looking at that um that was really the driving factor on on the recommendation for denial is is there is no other c2 in this area um and it's surrounded by agricultural um so that that was the the reasoning for that uh, again if the board feels that this would be a, a good uh, location for this restaurant by all means you know we would support it and we would um would work with the applicant to do so So um, my question about a special use permit, is that is that something that could be done if the board wanted to go that direction prior to having a, um, a general plan change? Madam Chair, Supervisor Bishop, uh, if I may, I actually have uh, my planning director. He's, he's chiming in as well. If I could have him help me in, in addressing those questions. Madam Chair, uh, members of the board, um, Supervisor Bishop, um, just to kind of clarify a little bit as well, the CRE zone uh, does allow for kind of like your country club, your resort type activities. Um, the Stetson Winery was rezoned in 2011 to CRE. So I do believe that's they were fitting the, the Stetson Winery under that um, approval is it's, it's more of like a country club. It does uh, interact with the agricultural uses on site. Um, a restaurant, uh, just looking at our CRE zone, I can't fit a restaurant in our CRE zone. It doesn't allow for it outright. Um, so that that's why we uh, told the applicant that that's the zone that they would have to go to if that's something that they would want to do on that property. The C2 zone also allows for your uh, auto repair shops, your um, retail stores, restaurants, gas station. That's one of the reasons why we feel that this is not a uh, appropriate zone for this location, that it, it shouldn't allow for those types of uses in the rural area. That's why we recommended uh, denial. As far as your question is concerned about a special use permit, we do use special use permits for uh, special events. Uh, so if they were going to be holding just a special event every six months, I think you can hold one uh, event every six months, not lasting more than four days. 
then they could um, apply for a special use permit. Uh, but other than that, I don't, uh, a special use permit specific for a, a restaurant is not something that's specifically allowed in the AR zone. Okay, and it, it's a, uh, it's not allowed in the CRE zone either, correct? Madam Chair, Supervisor Bishop, that's correct. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else, Supervisor Lingenfelter? Uh, I have a question for Director Latosky. It's more of a transportation-related question, obviously. Thank you, Director. Um, a lot of the, the comments that have come into my office with those that have concerns, they, they sort of focus on the transportation aspect and, and um, having to drive through Val Vista neighborhood in order to get there. Um, but then also, I, I know this doesn't have exactly um, a lot of rel relevancy to what these applicants want to do, but we know that there's a home builder that is going to be planning to uh, construct hundreds of homes out there. Um, so my question is, I believe this location is close to Superstition Drive. Um, and and really, um, how do you see that it's been designated as a county highway route, um, so it's allowable to have funding appropriated to that? Um, and we're going to need a second um, ingress and egress or into that neighborhood as it continues to grow. Um, so would you say um, when that gets developed, is that going to be the primary route that folks use to get out into that area of Bell Vista? I'm in Church Supervisor Lingenfelter. With regard to this particular site, it's uh, in and around the Brook Boulevard area, so I would foresee uh, that Contro could still be the uh, primary ingress and egress for those that may be visiting from outside the Val Vista area. Uh, superstition is uh, going to be some distance to the north of Contro Drive. So um, while Superstition does provide an access point to the greater northern part of Valley Vista, um, you know, it, it could be an option. I'm not so sure it would be uh, any time savings, travel time savings, if a person, say, coming from the Kingman area would take Superstition Drive. Um, but in all lessons, uh, with a plethora of development, residential development adjacent Concho, the travel time difference may not be too substantial. In fact, it might be more or less the same. Uh, uh, so uh, it all depends on how superstition is laid out. If there's a more of a higher speed, you know, 35, 40 miles an hour, and not too much uh, driveways, where Concho has a lot of driveways, yeah, it, it might actually be a, uh equivalent travel time, even though the travel distance may be just slightly greater. Uh, developments like this as well will generate probably traffic internally, you know, for Greater Valley Vista, you know, residents that just want to, you know, partake in a, in a dinner. Thank you. Any other questions? Supervisor Johnson? And thank you, Madam Chairman. No, I had plan and zoning recommend denial, and we had the commission recommend denial. You know, with the spot zoning, I would have to with denial. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, this is in your district. Madam Chair, yeah. This one is a really difficult one for me because I, I have actually had some conversations with the applicant. Um, I think it's a great project. I believe in the project. I think it's it would be a great addition to the project. But on the other hand, you have... Um, County staff that has recommended denial. You had the Planning and Zoning Commission that unanimously recommended denial. So I, I just find myself sitting here searching for uh, a way to help them in the future to accomplish what they want to accomplish, but at the same time be respectful of the analysis that has gone into the rules that are already on the books. Um, it's a tough place to be. So, uh, I mean, I think... This is spot zoning right now, um, and it doesn't it doesn't mean that I don't believe in this project. Um, but I'd like to keep working with the applicant to hopefully get to a place where they're able to do what they want to do under the appropriate either special use permit or or, or something. Um, but as it stands, um, I have to recommend 
that um, we side with the staff and the PNZ Commission on this and deny. Okay. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. 55 is withdrawn. 56, I'm going to open the public hearing. Discussion possible action. Approve the adoption board super resolution number 2024-069, which is an amendment to the Mojave County General Plan. A rezone from ROA5A single family residential manufacturing homes to an ROA1A. And the commission recommended approval by a 6 to 2 vote. I do have some people signed up. Jack Hamel, 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 Hamel. And then Don Harris. Good morning, Madam Chair and Honorable Supervisors. I would like to speak for two perspectives here. I love this city, I love the county, I love the whole thing we've got going here. Some rural, some commercial. We, there's needs for that. Everybody needs it. I've been asked by a bunch of people, and I mean a whole bunch of people, to come here and scream and yell and carry on and, and ask for this to be put away. I moved here 25 years ago. I had a house built, so I'm partly responsible for the development that's going, the trend. But in this case, I'm going to ask the board to give serious consideration to the fact that your action here today, if you deny this, can prevent a heck of a tragedy. I'm the chairman of the Sohai Domestic Water Improvement District. We are, we, the district, are physically incapable of providing the water that would be required to support this development. We have, in the past, because of the, the growth, we've already tied into Valley Pioneers Water Company. We buy water from them to supplement ours. This situation here, our policy is now a longstanding policy. If a developer chooses to come in here and, and wants to really get serious about building and developing, our policy states that that developer is going to have to provide a new separate source of water and all the infrastructure for the distribution to all these homes. And at some point, when that all is all done to the satisfaction of the various applicable agencies, they deed that system, that entire system of water distribution and supply to so high domestic water industry, uh, district. The biggest, nastiest, most horrible thing I can contemplate about this thing is the cost of a well. We have, as the district, had three separate hydrogeologic studies done over the past 20 years. I've been on this board 23 years, so I know what I'm talking about here. We have found or have been told by the engineers that there is no suitable source of water in Sohai. We live in three separate canyons. None of the watersheds are big enough to provide the water necessary to make a, an aquifer. This person, the applicant for this thing, is quite likely, if he did chooses to pursue this thing, to go bankrupt digging that well. Well costs now are god-awful. And up in that canyon, or in our three canyons, there is no property available that lends itself to having a well drilled on it and supplying water. I would like very much to say I'm in favor of development, but not in this particular case. And if we, the water district, chose to go ahead and say, okay, we'll do this, and we fund it, then we are asking all the... <clears throat> May I continue a moment? Just wrap it up. Okay. I, if we went ahead with this on our own, we would be loading the cost of it on the existing subscribers. Okay. I cannot support that. <clears throat> okay, the, thank the, you the, very the, much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Don, Don Harris and then Catherine Green. Good afternoon. I'm Don Harris. Um, I live on Ramp Road in Sohai uh, community. Um, I strongly oppose this change in zoning. Um, a few of the reasons why is the excess traffic on Ramp Road and the concern of more homes as far as water supply is concerned, like Jack stated. Um, 
the applicant still has yet to be direct of his intentions of dividing this parcel into potentially five separate lots. Um, Ranch Road is not maintained by the county and this is the only access to that property. My husband is the only one after rain and monsoons that maintains it for us and our neighbors and the intersecting road Castle View is also maintained by one resident that, which is not the applicant. Um, in my opinion the applicant hasn't even did his homework whether our shared water district could supply more homes. Uh, this potentially increases our property taxes along with our water bills. Um, owners in Sohai pay a special assessment fee of $138.40 on our taxes for each parcel owned besides our water bills. Um, I feel like at this time we do not know enough of the potential concerns and issues for this change. Since the applicant and his father own 150 acres in Sohai, I believe this is opening the door for them to develop our community into a high traffic residential area. Um, the out-of-state owner has 18 other properties around Mojave County. Um, more of my neighbors would have spoken out uh, against this rezoning, but many of us were um, confused as to which parcel was being divided. Um, dozens opposed um, this uh, airstrip that he was proposing at the Zoning Commission hearing, and we believed that it was for the same 144-acre parcel. That parcel number was actually never on any paperwork, so I think a lot of people got concerned that it was that one. But I know many neighbors that are very strongly opposed to this as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine Green. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Green, and I live at 4680 Thurman Drive. My husband and I... Um, and our four children moved to the Sohai subdivision 29 years ago. We chose to live there because we raised our four children and we we're surrounded by the beautiful mountains and a quiet, peaceful surrounding and we have great neighbors. Um, I don't live in fear, but I do live in reality and I see a lot of what's going on and I, we strongly oppose the subdividing of this, these parcels because we just don't have the infrastructure to take care of all all that will need to be done to have to support all of this um that being the roads the water situation and um we really don't want the base of our mountain carved up into parcels that you know who's going to be it it just will open pandora's box is what we all believe will happen um there's also the environmental issue that would be impacted we have deer there we've got the free range cattle and there's so much more so we oppose the rezoning of the five acres um, down to the one acre because we just believe that it's a gateway to many more problems that we will be coming back here to deal with so um, we I thank you for your time and thank you for um, listening to our concerns thank you very much is there anyone else who'd like to speak to item 56 come on down logan marsh board supervisors chairman angus thank you again for letting me speak today um i do know the applicant would probably be here speaking on his own behalf but he had a medical emergency last week and has got airlifted to sunrise in vegas so i would i would ask if the board to probably reconsider this uh where he actually has the opportunity to talk um he's a really a great guy him and his his dad these are some of the first people i met when i moved to mojave county um I understand the fears from the constituents in so high. Um, I don't know the in-depths of his plans, but like the rest of you, I think I'd like to hear them. So I'd give the applicant the opportunity to actually speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. See Jennifer Esposito coming on down. Thank you, Chairman Angus. I watched the entire uh, planning and zoning meeting. Um, my only, my, my real concern with this is if you develop additionally, you know, more construction, more parcels, maybe more homes, is that the grading and the uh, construction might change the way in which the water flows off the mountain. I don't know if all of you um, have actually been to So High 
and, and understand, you know, the sort of the canyon way and the way that it's laid out there. But my concern is that if you start doing a lot of, of moving of dirt and, and clearing of brush and stuff, that you actually do change the way in which the rainwater and the flooding come off of the mountain. And being that the roads aren't maintained, my concern is for the, just for the safety and the ability of people to get in and out. Because I do know, being a property owner, in nearby Golden Valley, which is technically, I guess, all the same thing. But when those monsoons come through there, boy, they can really do some damage. So, um, you know, I would say that I'm I'm in opposition to this unless I can be swayed otherwise, just because of the public safety issue and the ability to get you know fire and EMS up there if it if it does cause additional flooding downstream or down down mountain from uh, the property owner in this case. You know, that's. That's just something that concerns me, so thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Item 56. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Madam Chair? Oh, yes, yeah, Supervisor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got a question for staff. This is just a land division. This isn't building homes or anything else, correct? Madam Chair, Supervisor Johnson, that is correct. Thank you. That's all I had. Okay. Chairman Angus, I'd like to ask Jack Hummel uh, to come back to the podium. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So, Jack, you're a member of the Soha So High Water District. Yes, ma'am. I'm the chair. You're the chairman of the board. Yes. Is, is there uh, concerns with the So High Water District providing water? And if there are concerns, is there a requirement that they be accepted into the Water District? Yes, there are concerns about our ability to provide water. We are overextended as it stands now. In order for this proposed subdivision to take place, we would have to demand her policy that the developer find a new separate water source and provide the, the water source and it, all the linkages, all the piping and everything that goes with it, require them to turn it over to So High Water District to deed it to us in perpetuity so that we manage it. That's a big cost. And add to that the cost of a well, which is god awful now. I don't know the cost now. Last, last, Excuse me for stammering. The last number I heard for a well, a 12, uh, excuse me, a 10 inch well was 60 bucks a foot. I don't know if that's still valid or not. But there's just, in all the studies we've had done, there was no, no pro approval, no availability of water, no substance, no aquifer beneath us. So we have a well in Johnson Canyon, we went from the city of Kingman, or at least, at least from the city of Kingman. We buy water also to supplement our, our water from the Valley Pioneer Water Company. So, so Jack, my question is, if, if we approve this um, division of property, is there anything in the Sohai Water District bylaws that say they have to buy water from your water district, or can they be on, say, water hall? Or drive or drill their own individual well. I believe that the the state law of availability says that they're going to have to buy water from us since we are adjoining immediately adjoining. As far as the water hall, that that could get god awful. The storage is another issue that we have to deal with with this additional load on the system. Okay, thank you, Mr. Esplin. Uh, do you know whether or not that's true that they would be required to? purchase water from the adjoining water district? Well, let me just make sure something's clear. It sounds like they are not in the district right now, correct? I beg your pardon. I'm hearing impaired. It doesn't sound like the parcel is in the district right now, correct? It is not. Just outside. It's immediately adjacent. Under ordinary circumstance, if we had the ability to supply it, we would be glad to. So if the parcel is not in a district, it's not subject to the district laws. It's not in the district. I mean, it's as simple as that. So he's going to have to figure out how to get water. He may contract with the district. He may petition to enter the district. He may haul it in. He may find other means to get it. But he's not subject to the rules of the district. But he also doesn't get the benefits of the district either. 
he doesn't have a right to district water because he's not within the district. Okay, thank you. So, uh, buyer beware of if they divide this property and decide to sell it, it's up to the uh, purchaser or the owner to figure out the water situation. Anything more, ma'am? No, thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else have a question for anybody? So this is in my district, and I understand the, the problems with water and so high, and it's, it's a, a valid concern, and it has been for, for as long as I can remember, but it shouldn't prevent a property owner from uh, dividing his land. That, that's his decision should this board approve it. And I, th I think we, we should approve it, and um, it's not our job to determine how they're going to get water to it or utilities of any type. Okay, is that a motion? Yes. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 57, I'm opening up the public hearing. Discussion, possible actions, approve the adoption of the Board of Supervisors Resolution number 204070, and that's a rescission of the Board of Supervisors Res Resolutions 2011-121 and 2013-128 to remove the energy wind overlay zone from an AR36A zone. Commission recommended approval by unanimous vote. Is there anybody who wishes to speak to this? Item 57? Anyone? Hearing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. It's the pleasure of the board. Chairman Angus, I'm not sure that I understand what we're doing here. Can oh, we okay. get someone to, uh, to give us a little more information? Okay, who's going to give us more information? Madam Chair, Supervisor Bishop, Board, uh, these items, so uh, item 51 and then now 57 and 58, uh, these items were some of the older items that have expired. We are going through and rescinding them. Uh, th they went through Planning and Zoning Commission, recommended rescission to them. Uh, just cleaning up some of these older items that have not met the requirements of their approvals. Okay, I understand. Yeah, let's just uh, clean up. There's nobody here interested enough to come to the meeting to oppose it. So, okay. Okay. Motion. I'll make a motion that we approve. Second. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Madam Fifth. Chair, on item number 58, I had a family member that worked on this, so I'm going to recuse myself and step away. Okay. So I'm going to open the public hearing for item 58. It's another rescission of Board of Supervisor Resolution 2007-535 and 2008-255 and 2008-325 to revert the property to an agricultural residential 10-acre minimum lot size. Um, we do have somebody signed up, and that is Bruno Russo. Good afternoon, Madam Chairperson, Board. My name is Bruno Russo. I reside at 4185 Lomita here in Kingman, outside city limits. Um, I represent the Golden Eagles Radio Control Club. Uh, we are a member of about 50 people or so who fly right across the field uh, a, a short distance from where this uh, change were, was originally to be taken place. So in this case, it seems like there is no request to make a change, which means that the land will stay as it is, which means that we can fly safely in that area and not have a problem. Uh, as I said, we are a radio control club that's been in the area for uh, probably six years at this site and as much as 20 years at other sites. We support the community. We support uh, things that happen in the community. And to keep the area near us open is to our benefit from a safety standpoint. So the recession of the order is good with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, anyone else wish to speak on item 58? Anyone? I'm going to close the public hearing. Chairman Angus, I'd like to um, see a map on where this property is located. Okay. Mr. Walsh? I am working on it. I'll have it up in just a second. Okay. All right, let's see if you can see my screen. This is located near the industrial park, the airport industrial park in Kingman. Uh, rather than turning right to go into the industrial park, you take a left onto Grace Neal Parkway. And this actually encompasses all of that area north of the Grace Neal Parkway. Well, I'm sorry, not all of the area north of the Graceville, Grace Neal Parkway, but between Avenida Verde and Avenida Halfley. Okay, and it was rezoned. Uh... How long ago? So back in 2009, um, it, this was proposed and, and approved as a specific zoning plan. So there was a 2,100 acre master plan development plan for this area. However, that was just before the, 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 the Great Recession that occurred and, and those plans uh, did not go forward. Okay, thank you. Motion to approve. Motion, do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, 59, I'm opening the public hearing, discussion of possible action, approve an amendment to ordinance number 2020-07, which ordinance was adopted pursuant to ARS 11268, establishing a fee schedule for the abatement of public nuisances. We do have a few people. Chuck DeShazer, still here? There you are. Chuck DeShazer, Topak, Arizona. Um before you is three options of a fee schedule, as I understand it. Option one would be uh, the sub or the contractor's cost. Option two would be the contractor's cost and a hundred dollar flat fee for the abatement fee schedule. Or the third option is basically let development services run amok and do anything they please. Charging $35 an hour for inspections, $35 an hour for administrative fees, title searches, mileage to and from wherever they're inspecting. And that is your third option. Be, I, I would deeply oppose that one because first it uh, violates 14th Amendment constitutional rights that somebody living any place in the county could be charged ridiculous amounts as opposed to somebody living right next door to the uh, building department. Uh, the uh, title search isn't really anything that anybody needs to be concerned with due to the fact that uh, it's not even a requirement to find out who owns the property. There could be leasing people there. There could be homeless people on a piece of property that's being abated and there's nowhere in the statute of 2020-7 that, that I can see that requires the uh, title search even be charged. And the hourly rates, $35 an hour equates to almost $73,000 a year uh, salary level, which is uh, about $10,000 more than any of the supervisors are currently making. And so I, I don't see that that's something that would go. I would recommend that you either go with option one or option two that are being recommended in this uh, background information. 
either the contractor's invoice or the flat rate of $100 if you even have to charge it due to the fact that if a cop pulls you over on the side of the road for a speeding ticket and it takes him 10 minutes to write a ticket, the judge isn't going to figure out you know, how much to charge you for his time that he's already being paid to do as compared to if he screws around and takes an hour to write the same ticket for somebody else because he happens to you know, want to be in the presence of a pretty girl or something while he's writing a ticket and spends an hour doing it. He, you know, you're going to have different fees for different people. I don't see that the people that we're paying to do these jobs need to be recovering any money besides possibly a $100 flat rate. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Esposito. she here? left okay um dave johnson dave johnson you here okay that's that's all that's signed up for that is there anyone else who would wish to speak to item 59 okay with that i'm going to close the public hearing <clears throat> anyone have any questions or supervisor madam johnson chair. yes thank you madam chair um this kind of goes back to where we got the county got itself in trouble with not collecting uh, fees to cover the expenses of somebody requesting something. Obviously, they didn't request this because they <laughs> violated the law. But if we don't collect the fees and collect what it costs us to do it, then the rest of the taxpayers are going to have to pay it. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Supervisor Gold. Thank you, Madam Chairman. If I get Director Walsh. Mr. Walsh. Yes, sir. Director Walsh, do we rec would we recover our costs at the $100 flat rate? Was that a, did we actually calculate that or was it just a, a number that we threw out there? Madam Chair, uh, Supervisor Gould, the $100 fee was, was basically one that we thought would be we, in all the cases that we do, we we at least uh, incur a hundred dollars. So so it was it was not calculated as an average cost. It was more calculated as one of the things to consider is we can't charge more um, than what our costs are. So if we had a, a, a say a five hundred dollar fee or, or something like that, and we didn't reach that five hundred dollars, um, we basically we'd be going back to what we're currently doing and tabulating all of our costs to get up to it at a hundred dollars. Um, there would be no question. We'd be able to reach that in any of these cases as a, as a title report is, is nearly a hundred dollars. But it wouldn't recover our costs. That's correct. It would not. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions for Mr. Walsh? Madam chair. Yes. Uh, Mr. Walsh, just one question, um, and this is more for the the outlying areas. I, I think you testified last time we spoke about this at a, at a board meeting. Um, the furthest travel times are, are perhaps up to the Strip and then maybe to the Lake Havasu City area. Is that correct? That's, uh, I believe those are some, definitely up to the Strip is our furthest distance. Um, Havasu is, is you know, basically we're looking at um kingman being our base except for the the fort mojave mojave valley area where um, we do have inspectors that would leave from from our our bullhead office um so yeah i think as you're looking at say even wiki up or, or lake havasu or definitely going up to the strip we've, we've got some good travel time to get to those locations great all right um and then another thing that I remember coming up is just multiple title reports. Um, how many title reports? Is there a cap on title reports? Generally, what we've seen, we, we typically will pull a title report to start a project, um, and then we'll pull another title report right before it's it's abated. Uh, the, this, the whole intent is to capture any interested parties. Uh, we will at times, if, if a project is is lagging or, or it's taking some time, or, or we're working with the the property owner and they're making some improvements, but but not addressing the full issue, 
um, for whatever reasons, if we see delays in projects um, more than like say three to six months at a time, uh, we may pull another title report to ensure that, you know, title hasn't changed hands or, or there's not an, an additional interested party. Got it. Okay. Um, I'm not, I mean, I certainly want the staff to, to recoup their costs, but um, I guess I would throw out if, if option three is a consideration, maybe we could cap, we could cap um, all those costs to a certain limit, whether it's a thousand or whatever it is for folks up north. Do you have any thoughts on that, Mr. Walsh? Chairman Angus, uh, Supervisor Lingenfelter, staff would be open to, to whichever direction the board would like to go on this. Um, th that would definitely be an option that, so that it doesn't become an overburden, you know, on those areas that just based on location it is costing us more. But yeah, we, we could, we would, if the board would like to go that route, we'd be happy to support it. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Madam Chair. Supervisor Johnson. So, uh, Mr. Walsh, you're saying that you think my people ought to pay more money then to cover the cost <laughs> of people up north? You don't have sure. to answer, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, Chair Chairman Angus, Supervisor Johnson, uh, statute does allow for us to, to recoup all the costs related to it. Um, whether the board would like us to, to recoup all those costs or, or cap it at a certain amount, uh, we, we'd be happy to comply either way. Anything else, Supervisor Johnson? No, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? So what's, uh, what's the pleasure? Uh, Chairman Angus, if I can just jump in real sure. quick. So uh, there is, uh, as uh, Mr. DeShazer pointed out, there are three options to, uh, presented to the board here. The first one is just recouping the contractor costs. The second one is to recoup the contractor costs as well as a fee of $100. The third one is to recover all of the costs. That would be the staff costs and the title report costs. What does, what chair, what, excuse me, what, what Supervisor Lingenfelter, I, it sounds like what he's proposing is that option three, we recover the cost, but cap it, have a cap amount and say, you know, you start to recover your cost, but we'll cap it at whatever that amount is, 300, 400, 500 dollars, whatever you think that would be. And, and then we would just end recovering costs at that point. If I think that was what Supervisor Lingenfelter was proposing. Was that it? Yeah, I know it's, it's difficult when you have such a large county geographically, but I was thinking, you know, the fairest way, you know, I understand the, the abatement costs, you know, the cost of the title report. Hopefully they're conservative with how many title reports they do because I, I think we've seen some examples where they've done like six title reports. Um, that can bump up the cost. Um, mileage, I think, is probably appropriate, but, you know, if we're already paying somebody to go out and do a job, do we have to have the applicant reimburse staff time? Uh, that's a matter of debate. Um, Unfortunately, if you live up there, um, there's not a county facility, and you're going to have people that you're going to probably pay more for the same service. So I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Um, the only thing I would suggest is maybe a, a cap, but if that's not supported by the board, then it's the will of the board. So, Chair, Chairman Angus? Yes. I was just corrected by my chief building official um, in calculating mileage up on the strip area. We do calculate it from our Beaver Dam office. So it's not coming all the way from Kingman. It is originating at the Beaver Dam office. So that may, that will help as far as mileage goes on that. I appreciate that. Madam Chair, thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Anyone take a crack at the motion or a choice here? Madam Chair? Yes, Supervisor Johnson. I'd make a motion to collect full restitution for our costs. Okay, the second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? And if I could just add, just to be clear, so this is option three in the backup. It's option three, with, but there's no cap. Correct. No cap. Yeah. Okay. Everyone's okay. All right. We have a motion in a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
motion carries. Okay, item, um, where are we, 60. I'm going to open the public hearing, discussion, possible action, approve an amendment to ordinance number 202103, which ordinance was adopted pursuant to ARS 11861 regarding clarification of procedures for notification appeals and liens of unsafe structures and establish a fee schedule for abatements. We do have a few people signed up. Mr. DeSager again. Yes, before I speak, uh, I would request that... Uh, Someone, whether it be Tim Walsh or the clerk of the board, read. It would be the amendments that are being proposed for item 60, which would be, I see, under uh, section 8, letter E. If they could just read that and explain what it means, because I I don't understand half of what they're they're trying to get at because it seems to contradict itself between the uh, Board of Supervisors and the uh, Building Code Advisory Board. Uh, Chairman, we're in the public yeah, hearing. Yeah, we're in the public hearing. But I'd be happy to do that after the public hearing. I'd be happy yeah, to explain uh, it. If nobody understands it to begin right. with. We'll, we'll talk about it after the public hearing. Okay, because in Section E, as I read it, it's giving a from the notice of appeal 30 days uh, after the chief building official has written his notice to appeal it to the uh, building code advisory board but at the same time you have to have 30 days appeal to the uh, county board of supervisors uh, as E is written, and you don't know if you need to appeal it or not if you haven't been before the Building Code Advisory Board, which is what this is trying to remove, and that's what, what's so confusing about all this is, and on top of everything else, it also violates 2020-7 because the appeal to the Board of Supervisors it has to be 15 days or you lose all your rights instead of the 30 days. Uh, if it can be explained what they're trying to say, it makes absolutely no sense the way written and, and amended in here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave Johnson, he's not here. And uh, Jennifer Esposito. Jennifer Esposito, thank you. Um, I oppose this as it's written. I think it's extremely poorly written. I think it's extremely confusing. Uh, I still have concerns about any time you want to uh, sell someone their right to appeal something. Um, you know, I, I would oppose any codifying of that because I think that uh, you, know, it, you can appeal and you can appeal and eventually you're gonna get to court and if you get to court, then you have to pay to appeal. But honestly, um, this board sets the policies. Development services is a hot mess. It, it all goes back to the uh, international codes, which are only a framework. They are not supposed to be you know, swallowed whole and then figured out later. They're supposed to be used as a framework, even though I oppose them unilaterally, but a framework to be adapted to your particular situation, which doesn't really apply to rural Mojave County as like for HOA rules for Geneva, Switzerland or something with some of the stuff. But I think that the appeal should be just directly, I mean, if you want to have two appeals, okay, fine, but don't charge anybody for it. But since you guys make the rules, ultimately you set policy, policy is implemented by staff, that you guys should be uh, basically doing the appeal yourself and um the the here the advisory board is really only to advise the department because they're mostly contractors right and so their their livelihood depends on their good relationship with the department so i don't exactly see them as an impartial arbiter but i don't really think that that's their job if you want to add that extra layer of due process fine don't charge anybody for it but ultimately the decision should go from you and then 
from you to the superior court, a court of record, not to justice court or something else. But I just think this is very sloppily written. I, I don't think that it really deals with the problem. I, I, I think the only way really to solve this properly is to almost do like a complete repeal and rewrite of some of these sections rather than keep trying to put band-aids over here and band-aids over there and, oh, we found another problem. I mean, I, I oppose it in the way that it's written. I think it's poorly written, and I think you should should reject it in its current form and maybe work on it a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's all who signed up. Anybody else wish to speak to item 60? Yes, Mr. Marsh. Oh, that's right. Well, I think this is the most I've spoken one day. Uh, again, thank you, Chairman, Board. Thanks for having me again. Um, I also object to the way that this is written. I did have time to go through a lot of the backup documents. There are several things that concern me, but uh, I think what concerns me most being is I'm a car guy. Um, I like cars. I like to build cars. Currently, me and my daughter are in the middle of a project of building a really nice lifted Suburban. And if you go to uh, page 21, section K, um, they're amending the code. Uh, it's going to be section 3028, motor vehicles. Amend first sentence to read, except as provided for other regulations, including Mojave County zoning ordinance, no inoperative unlicensed motor vehicle shall be parked, kept, or stored on premise. And no vehicle at any time should be in a major state of disassembly or repair or a process of being stripped or dismantled. I know it exists. It shouldn't exist at all. You know, this is the American dream. I bought my property. If I want to take a car apart and do what the heck I want with it, I should. Um, there are so many things through these line codes that just make no sense. You know, and I'm a smart guy. I'm a business owner here in Mojave County. I've dealt with a lot of legal uh, situations where I had to read through legal garbage that is very, very, very hard to read. Um, this is not written correctly, and I, I really would suggest you guys send this back to be a little bit more understanding for us average folks. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, anybody else? Item 60. I'm going to close the public hearing. Anybody want to hear from anyone? I think Ryan wants to chime Ryan. in. Who? Ryan? Yeah, he okay. a dramatic reading. Uh, I can read the whole thing if you want, or can I explain it? Is it acceptable if I explain it? No, I, I wrote it. You're, I'm, I'm the one. You can laugh at me. I'm the one who poured the, well, I made the amendments to it. I did. I'm not trying to joke, but I did. And so I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. I'll be happy to explain it. So let me back up before I explain it so we kind of understand the, the genesis behind this. Uh, first off, we proposed a, a, a wholesale number of changes, and we came before the board, and the board didn't want to do that. And so I carefully watched the last board meeting when this was brought up in January, and there was two items that the board wanted to see. The two items from that meeting, and if you can go back, you can watch the meeting. One was the board was mostly open to the idea of appealing the Building Code Advisory Board decision to the Board of Supervisors. So the building, that, that was one idea was, okay, the Building Code Advisory Board decision, that gets appealed to the Board of Supervisors. The other idea was the board wanted to just remove the unsafe structure appeal from the Building Code Advisory Board and instead just have the Board of Supervisors make that decision. So it was kind of, I'm trying to mesh these two ideas and try to get this into here. One is appeal the decision of the, of the Building Code Advisory Board to the Board of Supervisors. And then the other one is, no, 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 we just want, we, want to, we don't want the Building Code Advisory Board to hear unsafe structures. Instead, we, we just want those to be brought to the Board of Supervisors. So with that said, I went back to the drawing board, and this is how I wrote it, and this is, what it, what, this is the explanation. So the Building Code Advisory Board shall serve as the board to review all decisions and actions of the chief building official, determine the suitability of alternative materials and construction, and provide interpretations of the code. So there, 
The Building Code Advisory Board serves to review the decisions of the Chief Building Officer, except, except that if the Chief Building Officer's decision whether a structure is unsafe or not, that is to be reviewed by the Board of Supervisors by filing a Notice of Appeal within 30 days of the date of the Chief Building Official's written decision. So basically, if the Chief Building Official says this is an unsafe structure, it comes directly to the Board of Supervisors. And that's what the Board wanted at the January meeting. So there's that. Okay. Then the next sentence says, the Building Code Advisory Board shall have no authority relative to interpretation of the administrative provisions of this ordinance, nor shall the Board be empowered, empowered to waive requirements of this ordinance or those provisions specifically provided in the reference codes of or, or of violating accepted in engineering practices. This statement was always in there. And then the next part. Decisions of the board, so this is the board, this is the uh, building code advisory board, shall be binding upon the chief building official and the appealing party, subject to further appeal to the Mojave County Board of Supervisors by filing a notice of appeal within 30 days of the date of the board's dis written decision. So there. So what we have is building code advisory, or excuse me, the chief building official makes the decision. If it's an unsafe structure, that appeal goes directly to the board of supervisors. If it's any other decision, because they make other decisions besides that, then it goes, it goes to the Building Code Advisory Code. After that is done, then that person could appeal it to the Board of Supervisors, and the Board of Supervisors would be, would be able to review the Building Code Advisory Board's decision. So then it says, the decision of the Mojave County Board of Supervisors may be appealed to the Superior Court by filing the action in the Superior Court no later than 30 days from the date of the Board's decision. So any decision this Board of Supervisors makes you can appeal that to the Superior Court. And that is necessary because we want to make sure that anybody will be able to appeal that to the Superior Court. Failure to follow the deadlines as stated in this section shall be grounds for dismissal of the appeal. I think that's brilliant. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. I think it's very confusing because sure. you're using the, the term board. Decisions of the board shall be binding out upon the chief building official and the appealing party. Well, if it's for an unsafe structure, there is no decision of the board. Because it's it didn't. Involved. Because it, exactly, it didn't. It went to the Board of Supervisors. Because it goes directly to the Board of Supervisors, that board is never involved with it. See, if you go back up, if you read the sentence before, sentence. exactly, except that the chief building official's decision whether a structure is unsafe shall only be reviewed by the Mojave County Board of Supervisors. So it never goes in front of the Building Code Advisory Board, which is what this board wanted, and what, what you wanted too. You wanted that previously. So I'm doing what you wanted, and I'm doing what the board wanted. Okay, the only, only other problem is the 30-day time frame is in violation of 2020-7. says you only have 15 days on an unsafe structure or anything else. No, 2020-07 is something completely different. 2020-07 is based on 11-268, and, and that is a dilapidated building. Okay. Dilapidated building is different than an unsafe structure. I thought that we could try to do that, but I spoke with staff, and I believe they're correct. A, a dilapidated building is different than an unsafe structure. There can be some overlap between the two, but there also could be some differences. And so, unsafe so the dilapidated building stays with 11268. Unsafe structure stays in the 2007 realm and, or 2003 realm. Excuse me, 202103 realm. So. Okay. Yes, Supervisor Gould. Thank you, Madam Chair Chairman. Ryan, d does this put the Building Code Advisory Board in a superior position to the Board of Supervisors in regard to the actions of the Chief Building Official? Chairman, uh, it looks like it does. Uh, it should not. And if I, I, I admit, look, I can go back to the drawing board again, and I can try to make it more clear. But the purpose of this, and what I tried to make here, was to make it so that the board of supervisors would be superior to the building code advisory board. And here's how they're superior: if there's an unsafe structure, it gets appealed directly to the board of supervisors. If it's anything else. It first goes to the Building Code Advisory Board, and then it gets appealed to the Board of Supervisors. So ultimately, either one, either decision, whether it's an unsafe structure or if it's any other violations, ultimately it can come before the Board of Supervisors if that person appeals it to that. So it would, 
the Board of Supervisors would always have a superior position over the Building Code Advisory Board. It doesn't look like that, though. If you can show me where, and I, I'd be happy well, to fix it. it says, the Building Code Advisory Board shall, ha shall serve the board, insert to review, strike four, all decisions and actions of the chief building official. Correct. Comma. Determine the suitability of alternative materials in construction, comma. Strike and add and provide interpretations of the code. So it looks like everything, then you go to your accept. Correct. Which, which is accept that the chief building official's decision whether a structure is unsafe shall only be reviewed by the Mojave County Board of Supervisors and then the notice of appeal. But it appears that we would not be able to review any other decision that's made by the chief building official. And the, the, the advisory board should be advisory to the Board of Supervisors. And to me, it looks like that puts them, it takes everything except for a, a uh, dangerous building away from the Board of Supervisors. So, but you keep reading in the paragraph, and I put in there, decisions of the board shall be binding upon the chief building official and, and the appealing party subject to further appeal to the Mojave County Board of Supervisors by filing that. If that's not clear enough, then I can, I can fix that. I, I, I can see where you're it's saying that. It kind of looks like you're referring to the decision of the board about the dangerous building. But the dangerous building would, wouldn't have gone to the Building Code Advisory Board because it was accepted up here. Yeah, I know. But I'm worried about other decisions because it almost appears to push, take other actions and decisions made by the chief building official and take them away from the Board of Supervisors so that only the, the advisory board has authority over that and we no longer have authority over it. Since they are advisory, I would think that we would still have authority over those things also. My intent was to do what you're saying. It was. And, and I can fix the language to get it so that it's more clear. I, I certainly can, if that's what the board wishes. But my intent was to do what you said. I, I did. I'm not, I'm not trying to slip something through. I'm not trying to, you know, try to, try to find something different. The, into, the, in, the intent was two things. One is unsafe structures come directly to the Board of Supervisors. And two, the decisions of the Building Code Advisory Board comes to the Board of Supervisors. That was my intention. And if you want, I can try to make that more clear. I'm not accusing you of trying to slip anything in. I know. Just I know, the, I know. It's a second set of eyes Absolutely. grinding through the language. And, and that my statement earlier that it was clear, I was tongue-in-cheek. It absolutely was tongue-in-cheek. I appreciate it. Uh, clearly, I did not uh, write it as clear, and it is more clear in my mind and not clear to everybody else. So I can make more changes if you want. Artwork is always beautiful to the artist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone else want to ask anything to Ryan? I also share the dismay that I cannot have a unlicensed or a uh, inoperable vehicle on my 160 acres of property. Um, I should not have to tag vehicles if I stay on my own property. And I can drive around and around and around a lot, and I'm still on my own property. That was one of the many reasons I did not vote for the 18 building code, nor did I vote for the International uh, Property Maintenance Code. Thank you. Okay, so what, yeah. what? Yes, Supervisor Johnson. Does Supervisor Gould want to make a motion to remove that part? Madam Chairman, I don't think we're agendized to strike that. I think it was agendized only for the change. Which one was that? Uh, to to uh, to strike the? If you strike oh, you know, page not. twenty-one, item K. I'd, I'd, I'd prefer that we have that as a separate agenda item. I figured that's what you were going to say. Yeah. It would have to be agendized, I think, to review that. So do you want me to, to make some changes here and bring it back? I could do that. I can make these changes and try to try to massage it a little bit better. Um, the other thing, too, is we also wanted to, we were waiting to see what the board wanted to do with the fees in 2020-07 because we want to try to be consistent in 2021-03, and I could try to do that. And I can bring that back too. I can bring that all back and say, okay, I'll make some changes to E here, and then get that fee schedule similar to what we what we just adopted. 
time frame. That's fine. Um, I would think that would be best to have okay. Ryan work on it a little further. Okay, so you want to uh, continue it till given a certain time? I, I can do it in the next by the next board meeting. Well, could you give me to April? Give me the first meeting in April. Um, Madam Chairman, I move that we continue this item to the first meeting in April. Okay, you heard that second. motion. Thank you. Motion second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. We are on the regular agenda now. Number 61, yeah. from Tim Walsh, Development <clears throat> Services, discussion of possible action, approve the adoption of the Board of Supervisors Resolution number 2024075, which amends Mojave County Resolution number 2020-178, specifying the functions and duties of the Building Code Advisory Board. This amendment makes the finding or decision of an unsafe structure only appealable to the Mojave County Board of Supervisors. I have two people signed up to speak. Again, Mr. DeSager. Again, Chuck DeShazer, Topak, Arizona. Um, on this issue, I have a couple of things on the background information. Uh, you have, a, I don't know if Ryan did it or Gilbert did it or whoever, but it, it sure looks like a third grader with a crayon from, you know, trying to reset resolution 2020 uh whatever to 178 to 2024 075 i don't know if it's amendments to existing resolution or a freudian slip when in whereas the board of supervisors wishes to amend the functions and duties of the building code advisory board so that the funding not findings of the or decision of an unsafe structure are only appealable to the Mojave County Board of Supervisors. It needs to be finding, not funding, on that front page. And in the other amendment to this under Exhibit A on the second page, it appears that we have a chief building inspector and a chief building official all within the same paragraph. Do we have different people or is it titles? You know, I'm not really opposed to removing the building code advisory board from anything that is happening here. It's just that really poorly done as far as whether we have officials, inspectors, or officers as chief building. That's where I sat on it. Thank okay. Um, Mr. Esmond, do you want to? I don't know where the where the errors are. The first one? The first one is on Russia. Yeah, the exhibit A. It has to do with funding or decision. The whereas, the third line down. Probably a Freudian slip at this point, but I'm just seeing if I have the same one. Okay, so I'm looking. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I know the county loves funding everything, so. All about funding. Uh, I see. I, I, I was looking at an older version. And uh, so uh, certainly I can make that to be finding. Okay. And then on the, sec the next page where it talks about Exhibit A in the very top paragraph, the paragraph reads, building official, and then in the amendment in red that it talks about chief building inspector. I don't know if that's the top inspector or there's a difference between those or it's just misworded or... I can, I can make that change as well or if there's a chief building officer, which would be a third option. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Do you want to continue this also? I do. Okay. I do. Actually, we're in the public hearing. Oh, we're in the so public hearing. Do you want well, to? This is not a public hearing one. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's, yeah, not. it's a resolution. You're right. You're right. Good. I'm not screwing up there. You're right. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jennifer Esposito. 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my objections are the same as Mr. DeShazer's. The inconsistency of language is a typographical error. It's not that, that I object to taking that the particular intent of this is just that, as written, it needs to be fixed and cleaned up and brought back. So thank you. Thank you. OK, we want to make the motion, Supervisor Gould? I move that this item be continued to the first meeting in April. I will second. Motion second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Number 62, this is a, to approve the adoption of Board of Supervisor Resolution number 2024-031 to abandon the public use rights while retaining the public utility use rights within the portion of TW1 and undeveloped dedicated public right-of-way line between Olympic Drive and Flightline Drive. We have nobody signed up to speak. Anyone? Chairman Angus, motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 63. This has come from Human Resources. Discussion possible action approve the following exceptions to general fund hiring freeze. Approved on August 21st, 2023, the clerk of the Superior Court, courtroom clerk, development services, office assistant, and Justice Court Kingman Serbot, Justice Court Services Assistant. Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Number 64, District 1. Madam second. Chair, no action required. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on then to 65. This is brought by me, and it's a funding agreement for an opera project. I make a motion to approve. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. 66. Discussion, possible action, receive an update and review the status of Mojave County Public Lands and Recreation Commission. I, I asked um, Mr. Elters to bring this back. It's been a long time since we talked about it, and little by little, the appointments from the supervisors have come in, and now we do have five. Um, I think there may have been a little bit of misunderstanding about going forward. Uh, as Mr. Elters explained, you want to explain what you thought? Well, let me, let me go on. That we have people who have specific specialties that might help and assist this particular board with specific projects like like power or solar, you know, things like that. Um, but I don't know if that was, I think that gets it a lot more complicated. I, I would prefer, and I'm, that's why I'm bringing it to the board, that we go ahead and start um, making it a, a date for these people to meet. And then when they get the administrative part of it, they'll, they'll elect a chairman. And uh, we need to appoint somebody from development services like we did for the first uh, commission uh, and then a supervisor I think we talked about it uh, and I think I'm, I'm not sure that we decided but I think you you offered to volunteer to be on that that commission and because because of a lot of the public lands issues and uh, that's what I would like to do just keep this thing moving forward because it seems to be just Stop. Yes, M Madam Chair. Um, when the board approved this, they approved the bylaws, and the bylaws in in them said five people appointed by the board and these five specialty people. So, as the bylaws are written right now, you would have to have seven people appointed to move forward. So, it would have to be an item to revise the bylaws before you could just well, move forward and have we, them meet. But could we appoint those people after we? meet they meet for the first time they can't meet until there's seven people on the board because the way the bylaws are written you won't have a quorum until you have seven. seven people including the person the the supervisor it's not seven voting people your bylaws said All right. the, the bylaws that were approved said five voting people one each from um supervisors and five that were of a special is that what ha was that the intent? I believe it was. Okay, so you got one to a point, so you might. What's that mean? However, you you guys could bring back an item to change those bylaws, but until they're changed, you have to have seven people. In appointed. order to get this going, what do we have to do next meeting? And I'm chair board members. Um, I sense your frustration because <laughs> I told you when I discussed it with you. Yes, I'm frustrated. So 
indeed, uh, as you stated, and as you heard from the clerk, when this item, when the board directed staff to bring this item, we did, and the understanding was 10 appointed, five from each district, and five for five discipline uh, special subject matter experts. So we have the five from each district, but clearly we need seven to have quorum. So if I may, I'm going to make a suggestion to you. In order to have the five subject matter experts, I would, I would be more than happy to reach out within to staff and the various departments, solicit names, bring them to the board, at perhaps if you would, if you would work with us uh, and allow it, maybe in a month at the longest, maybe t maybe in two weeks, offer you names. If you're comfortable with them, you can appoint at least two because we need one for uh, farming, ranching, one for environmental services, uh, uh, you know, one for appraisal slash, uh, um, uh, gosh, real estate, and then so on. So if it's acceptable to you, I will present you, I'll bring you names. You can take a look at them. We'll do our best to vet them before we present them to you. If it's acceptable, at least you point two to get us up and running, and then we can go from there and appoint additional members uh, until we have full quorum. Is is that an acceptable option? Who who was supposed to do this in the beginning, according to bylaws? We were supposed to bring the people in. I mean, that was, seems a little unwieldy, which is probably why it's stagnated. Because you know, I, I'm not going to say here's this person, not knowing what supervisor ghoul we can't talk. So, um, yeah, I guess that's the best way. But any way to expedite this. Madam Chair, not to say that was your intent, but honestly, that was my understanding that the board, the board, okay. each board member was going to appoint two, one from each district and one for the special. It's hard enough to get one. <laughs> um, no, I, I'm with you. I, that's why I said it was, I, I don't know that it was your intent, but that was my understanding. And that's why I'm jumping in and saying, with your permission, I'll reach out to staff, we'll, we'll solicit, we'll bring you some names, we'll do our best to vet them, and we'll try to cover the five subject uh, matter expert areas and bring you some names to where you can appoint them, at least to get enough for seven to get a quorum uh, in place so you can start, they can start meeting, and then we can continue to appoint until we have a full quorum. Madam Chair, yes. thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for Attorney Esplin. So the item was agendized with the following language: adopt any revisions to the Commission's bylaws, including but not limited to modifying its functions, duties, and responsibilities, making changes to the membership and officers, amending its meetings, or terminating the Commission. So what are we allowed to do since since it was agendized that way? So you're allowed to adopt um, you're allowed to adopt any revisions you want to make to the bylaws. So you can do that today. We do that today. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was agendized that way. Yeah. That was it's my understanding. There. So if she wants to make a motion to take it down to five, we could take it down to five. If that's what you wish to do, you'd be amending the okay. bylaws, which is permissible today. Yeah. yeah. Or we could terminate and start all over again and try to do it right the next time. Uh, you could terminate the commission if you want that. We put that on there too. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to terminate it because we've told people and people are waiting patiently and I don't think that that is a, the right thing to do. Being that I think at least some of us thought it was going to be put together with the initial five and then the, the supervisor and somebody from development service like we did last time and that was always my intention to mimic what we did last time. Um, so it got kind of fuzzy and that's okay. So if we could take it to five with a supervisor and a staff member that the manager appoints the county manager appoints would that be something that this board could um, work with and then when they meet and do their you know their 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 administration of who's going to be chairman and stuff and then they can decide how they want to go forward and which specialties they want to go forward with and i have a question how do we determine which supervisor is going to be in on this board how we did it before is somebody just um just volunteered. Well, Supervisor Lingenfelder volunteered, but I don't know that it was put out to any of the rest of us. I think, well, I think we talked about it, but if you have another idea of how to do it. Madam Chair, yeah. if I may, um, I would certainly throw my hat in the ring for that. It doesn't have to be me. Um, what I threw my hat in the ring for is 
um, half of that new Baj monument was within District 1. And then also there's um, at least a 70,000 acre uh, wind farm proposed up in the north section of the county. Um, and then also there's some lithium mining in the Wiki, in the Wiki up area within District 1. Um, so I would want to be on that for those reasons, but I'm certainly not opposed to hearing anybody else's interest as well. Does the real estate member have to be a current realtor or can they be a former realtor? I'm looking at the bylaws right now. I'm trying to see. Um, Chairman Angus. Yes. I just wanted to put out there that uh, Supervisor Johnson has been involved in our public lands for as long as I can mm -hmm. remember. I don't know if this was presented to him as a possibility that he might be able to chair this as well. For the same reasons okay. that Supervisor Lingenfelter right. is uh, concerned. With, uh, Supervisor Johnson, would that be something you'd be interested in doing as well? Uh, if you need me, I would. And to clarify for Supervisor Gould, I think if they identify a river, it would be accepted. I, I'm sorry, I did not understand what you were saying. Supervisor Johnson, are, I, are you getting the echo? Okay, we, let's start again. I'm sorry, Drew, there seems to be some static on the line. Can you repeat that one more time? Uh, sure, I would. I would be be considered if you need me to do it. Uh, you're probably going to have the meetings up in the Kingman area, so it might be easier for, you know, Supervisor Lingenfelter or Supervisor Bishop or somebody up there closer. And I just want to let Supervisor Gould know that on the realtor thing, I think if you identify as a realtor, you could qualify. And to answer the question real quick, um, it's it, it doesn't specifically have to be a realtor. It's just an assessor, appraiser, knowledge representing the private property interests of Mojave County. So it could be a current realtor, it could be a past realtor, somebody that has knowledge in the area of assessor appraisal of private property. Knowledge of assessor or appraisal. So assessor or appraisal knowledge, you know, representing the private property interests of Mojave County. I think at the time we were talking about putting the, literally putting the assessor on the board is what I think that meant. Madam Chair, yes, if I may make a comment um, in respect to Supervisor Johnson's longstanding uh, presence on public lands issues, I would absolutely defer to him if, if he wants to do it. Um, if he doesn't, I'd be happy to still do it. Everybody tries to get out of it. Okay. So where are we at? We can change it. We can say that um, I make a motion that we change the bylaws to five members appointed by supervisor districts plus a county supervisor and a, um, a staff member um, appointed by the county manager. Second. Okay, we have a motion second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, so we, we have to, when we come back, would we have to, who, how do we decide which supervisor? Or should we have put that in the motion? Probably should have put that in the motion. Yeah. We can make another motion. Okay. So being that, I do think the meetings will be up in Kingman, but if there's issues that Supervisor Johnson has been working for years on, like the uranium, then, you know, you can come up or come in via Zoom. Would that work for you, Supervisor Johnson? Sure, whatever I can do to help. Very good. Okay. So I make a motion that we appoint Travis Lingenfelter, um, the supervisor representative to our Public Lands Commission. I thought you just asked Buster to do that. No. He, I said would he be if there's an issue I that see. he wants to because it's gonna, they're going to be up here in Kingman. And um, unless you're okay, I think it's just easier to have somebody present than someone coming in. But any issue that Supervisor Johnson has been involved with, he will come up. And so my, my thought, uh, Madam Chairman, was that Supervisor Lingenfelter is – most of the issues right now are in his district, so maybe an outside supervisor that has the knowledge that Supervisor Johnson has would make it look more fair to the general public. 
rather than a, a supervisor that has um, uh, more involvement. Well, there can be an argument made that that's what you want. You want a supervisor where they, their, their land, they're representing people and that they have the biggest skin in the game. So I, I don't know if I agree with you on that one. But I made a motion to appoint uh, Travis Lingenfelter as the representative from the Board of Supervisors. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Four to one. And I think that's Supervisor, it. You. <laughs> That's it. Um, if there's nothing else, is there anything else? Okay, this meeting's adjourned.